Greetings Comics Emotion and Sandman fans and welcome to the uh, book club. I'm just here to say that three great friends, Rhea Carrigan, Tony Farina and Steve Connery couldn't make it onto the episode and they're all huge massive Sandman fans but you will see special messages they recorded throughout the course of the episode and I'm really really grateful that they did that for us. And I'm also here to say that I made a bit of a mistake at the end of the show where I said that Sandman came out in 86 reading intros and rereading Neil Gaiman's Black Orchid which came before Sandman that's when these stories came into planning and when they first came to be and I said that's when they were released and they weren't Sandman came out in 1988 so that little mix up there just wanted to get clarified but apart from that enjoy the show enjoy listening to great friends talking about one of the best comics ever Sandman Preludes and Nocturnes the first volume of the wonderful Sandman library enjoy Before Gods after gods, timeless, endless. Every creature has a destiny, even if that destiny is death. Should they live, they will dream, feel the burn of desire or the depths of despair. They will perform acts of creation and destruction. In life, they will experience delight or be led through the halls of delirium. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Welcome to the worlds of the Sandman. One morning, when Gregor Samsa awoke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed into a horrible vermin. That's the opening line of one of the greatest works of fiction of all time. It's The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. And what happens is, that's, the, that's just it. You don't know. You don't know. And the beautiful thing about that story is you never find out, ever. You never find out. And Neil Gaiman, this guy right here, who gave us these beautiful books with these beautiful paintings on the cover of each one, who created this guy over here, dropped us into the middle of the story without giving us any answers. It would be decades until he actually told us what happened. We know why it happened. We know what they were trying to do by the end of this first volume. We know they were trying to capture his sister and they accidentally captured him. And we don't actually get the story for years and years. And Neil was okay with that. And if we had never gotten that story, if we had never actually found out what happened, I'd have been okay with that because it doesn't take away from anything about the perfection that is Sandman. Neil Gaiman, like Franz Kafka from before him, and like all the avant-garde writers that Neil has followed in their first steps, he just said, look, you're smart. Readers are smart. People who are picking a book, it doesn't matter what kind of book you're picking up a book, you are smart enough to go along on this journey. And he treated, he treats his audience with respect and he treats all literature as literature, science fiction, you know, straight literature, whatever. He's written it all. He can do it all. He can fucking do anything. But what he did is he just trusted us and it was just courageous and it was wonderful. And it's why the Sandman story is why here you all are watching and listening to the Sandman book club is perfect. It's the perfect book club. It's the perfect book club book. I mean, I know you're like book club books. It's like the lady across the house, right? And they made that whole thing. And But what makes this is that Neil is, is saying to you, I have an interesting story to tell. I'm going to drop you in the middle of it. And I'm going to trust you reader to follow along. And I'm not just going to write it like regular fiction. I'm actually going to give you these gorgeous images and I'm going to add layer upon layer to the story. And so he's created literature in a whole new way. And sure, you know, sequential art exists. He didn't invent that. He didn't even invent this kind of storytelling. Kafka didn't invent this kind of storytelling. There's been others who have done it. But what they do and the successful ones are not only amazing, brilliant writers of literature, but they create characters that live with you forever. Gregor Samsa lives with me forever. The Endless, they live with me forever. I think about them all the time. I love these books. And while I can't be with everybody today, I know that you are in excellent hands. This is going to be 
one of the greatest conversations the Comics in Motion family has ever done for book club. And hopefully as time goes on, we'll do more, we'll cover more of the volumes and everyone will want to read along and just enjoy themselves, think big thoughts, know that the writer of this trusted you and you should trust him. So have fun. Welcome to The Dream. Welcome to another episode of the Comics in Motion Book Club. And this episode will focus on Preludes and Nocturnes, which is volume one of Neil Gaiman's legendary Sandman series. Uh, We have the Dark Angel. Comics in Motion's very own Catwoman, Tonya Todd. Tonya, welcome to the Comics in Motion Book Club. Meow, and thank you for having me. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And we also have Mike on the mic. The force is strong with this one. It's Mr. Burton. How are you, Mr. Genuine Chit Chat? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. I'm very interested to speak with you guys about uh, this very legendary comic I've heard so much about that I finally found time to read some of. <laughs> Fantastic. Also with us is the golden age, golden oldie, but goodie, Mr. Matthew B. Lloyd. You got the old part right. Thank you. (laughs) You both are, brother. I'm a little bit older than you, so. (laughs) You are, you are. (laughs) So there you go. And of course, joining us is one of the dynamic duo who started Comics in Motion, the dangerous, deadly, incredible Horrocks himself. Dave, welcome to the Sandman episode, brother. Incredible. Wow. So that was brilliant to uh, to speak to you and all, all the people we've got today. I honestly can't wait to get into this one. Um, such a legendary book, but I honestly, it's, it's been on my shame list that I've never read it. And so this actually forced me to sit down. I must admit, I, I did buy it ages ago and I tried about three times to read it. And I just thought, you know what, I've got no idea what's going on and walked away from it a few times. So I'm glad I actually this activity here forced me to sit down and read it well, any questions you have you do have a couple of comics experts and uh i love this story wholeheartedly it literally did change my life so let's get straight into it so we're talking preludes and nocturnes and obviously we start at the beginning and then when we get to the end we'll stop that's actually a line from one of the characters in Sandman, which we'll learn in later chapters and this is the sleep of the just where we meet morpheus and several other very dodgy British people, which is something Tonya is getting very used to on a daily basis. So, Tonya, what did you think of Sleep of the Just? Well, it did pull me right in. I wanted to know who these people were. I really, I wanted to know who this creature was that they captured. And as I'm reading it, I'm thinking that they were aiming for death. And I thought for a moment that it was death. I don't remember when I figured out that it was not. (laughs) After reading the whole thing, it made me want to just go back and read the entire thing because I feel like there's all these details in the first episode where you're just like, this was important and I didn't realize it was important. And you know, you're drawing out memories. I you were right. It's something to just sit with for a very long time. And I don't think that you can capture all of this in one reading. Absolutely right. It's definitely a revisit kind of book. Uh, and what did you think, Mike? Yeah, so I thought it was really interesting. I think, as Tony said, it sets up the world really well, and it's it's the law element that it does expertly. You know, the dialogue's very well done, as one would expect from Neil Gaiman, and the artwork's really good as well. But it's that sort of, you know, it needs to grab you and bring you into the world and let you know enough to hook you without just, you know, being an exposition dump, uh, you know, which can be an issue. So I really like the elements that you get intrigued into certain elements because it's like, you know, oh, there's these, you know, as Tony said, so, you know, they're it's basically being they're trying to get death. They didn't get death. But then it's like, okay, well, there's two individuals, death and dream. And then who else is there? And even by the end of this volume, there's, there's a few names mentioned in passing. It's like breadcrumbs to kind of make you, right, here's this self-contained story, but you're only, you're only looking through the keyhole into the world that this is. And each chapter is almost like a very small step within that. So I thought it was very, uh, very clever and very, yeah, for someone who's obviously into things like Star Wars, where I just love lore, reading all these sort of things and how it can connect into sort of, uh, you know, I like craziness that can connect into our understanding of reality. I really like those threads as well. 
Excellent. Very well put. And the breadcrumbs is something we'll come back to. And obviously, Matt, because you know the DC universe about as well as anybody I've ever met. How did you take this first chapter? I, I find it interesting that even though I, I mean, I, I've known about Sandman since it first started, but unfortunately, it's something I never read at the time it came out. So I have all this, you know, tangential knowledge of the character and his world and that sort of thing. Uh, so going into it, I feel like it's kind of like I didn't go into it cold, not knowing everything. So I go in knowing that's end man they're getting or dream, not death. I know that just because you just know that. Um, it does, uh, and and I think it affects your my perception of of how I took the whole uh, the whole book, and it kind of gets into how I uh, experience fiction and what I like about stories and stuff uh, that sort of separates the first seven issues for me from the eighth issue, which I think is something you'll definitely touch on later, knowing what you've already mentioned. Um, so uh, the, one of the first things I noticed was, uh, I made some notes, obviously, and I said, is his helmet supposed to be a visual reference back to Wesley Dodd's Golden Age Sandman mask? Is that, the, is that supposed, supposed to be happening, or is it just something weird to look scary or am i am i supposed to think oh it's sandman because also unfortunately i i'm i've read you know my copy has the karen Berger intro so i read that first and you learn a lot in there about where the see how the series started where it came from sort of what it became and how it got there while it starts in one place and uh and and i really connected with that uh assessment of the this first uh volume so to me i almost feel like it's two separate things like i feel like eight is separated out from the other seven um and if you go into it you know you see a lot of stuff from like you said the dc universe we're gonna see with and i i, I didn't think about which where each issue ends and what's what's what so uh, just a couple quick early thoughts are you know seeing Cain and Abel seeing Wesley Dodds referenced um, uh, Glob and Brute reference from Jack Kirby Sandman series from the 70s uh, and then uh, just looking at some of the art uh, it reminds me some of Graham Ingalls stuff from EC Comics in the 50s who was known for his horror work in those books whose nickname was Ghastly so that was his he was known for his horror stuff and it seems like Sam Keith and uh uh, Mike Dringenberg's the stuff in the first part when I think Keith is penciling it and Dringenberg is inking it. There's some stuff that really reminds me of uh, of uh, of his work. Well spotted and purposefully so. It's one of the reasons that Sam Keith was picked to draw the series. Brilliant observations. I'll be touching on a lot of those because Tony has said something very similar as well. So Dave, obviously, again, like Mike, and like Tonya, fresh into this world, what did you make of the first chapter? And again, any observations, any questions you had on that? Yeah, like I say, I tried to start this, you know, a few times before. And I, I think like when I start a book like this, when, I, when the world is big, you know, you're not just going into a simplistic story, you know, the characters, you know, I, I wasn't even sure coming into this, whether it was really in the DC universe, because I know it's Vertigo, so I kind of thought, well, maybe it's just this separate thing. And then it was only as I was going through, it's like, oh, right. It, actually, I think it was when John Constantine uh, turned up. I was like, oh, oh, right. OK, so that's where we're going with it. But I think because when I tried to read it before, I, I, it was late at night, you know, and you pick it up and I'm like, we're jumping from this place to that place. We're suddenly in, you know, in World War Two, uh, World War Two, World War One. We're in Verdun, you know, and uh, you've got a guy who's fourteen there. And I'm like, all oh, right, that's going to be important. I'm going to have to remember that. And then, oh crap, I've forgotten it. So you know, I'm like, I know that, that there's a bunch of stuff that I'm missing, and, and I'm going to echo a little bit what Tonya said that. I definitely think this, but I can tell already this book rewards multiple reads. So going through it this once, I know it's a flyby, you know, and we've kind of got the essence, you know, the basic plot, but I want to go back and just explore more of those layers. And I, I, again, I, you know, genuinely really excited um, to, to 
pick your brains as well as to what's really going on, you know, and especially some of these characters. Like, I didn't know who uh, John D was, um, you know, so it, it, he was just a new character for me, but what a despicable bastard, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, I, I, I wouldn't say I was blown away by the whole book, but it was enough of a taster to say, oh, wow, I could see how this is going to be, you know, uh, a big, big story. And so I went from, you know, knowing that it's got all these accolades and all of this praise and everything um, to, and, and starting it off and being a little bit like, okay, what's, what's this all about to, okay, all right, I get it. Very good. Absolutely right. This first book, not just this first chapter, this first book, is literally some very complex world building. What Neil Gaiman does better than just about anybody, and we've all mentioned it, is the breadcrumbs. With this book, yes, you will need to read it multiple times, especially when you get to book two, because you realise that, hang on, why do I know that name? Hang on, where have I seen this before? Hang on, what was that other person called? In this very first chapter, for example, we see, obviously, the Burgess family. Ethel Cripps, her son, John D. Now, John D is uh, a famous DC villain, Dr. Destiny, from uh, the 60s and 70s, from the Silver and uh, Bronze Age. And he used the power of the Dreamstone. But now, obviously, in this book, we find out where he got the Dreamstone, who the Dreamstone really belonged to. So already Neil Gaiman is tying in a disparate element of the DC universe for his Sandman, because Karen Berger wanted him to write a book after he wrote Black Orchid. But she wanted him to do the Sandman as in the Jack Kirby Sandman or the possibly the Golden Age Sandman. But he said, well, how about I make a new Sandman, but they're all linked. And he did it brilliantly. Matt, like you said, Morpheus's mask is actually based on myth. Um, if you look through Greek mythology, Morpheus and the, the dreaming, uh, that aspect of um, historical mythology, that mask is from there. But obviously... The way Sam Keith designed it was, with those big eyes, it did bring to mind the gas mask. And when Wesley Dodds became the Sandman, the Golden Age Sandman, when the universe is trying to fill that gap that Morpheus had left behind, that's the image he took for his own. Now, it's brilliantly clever, because I don't know if you know this, that from 1917, uh, through the 20s and 30s, there was a pandemic of a disease called encephalitis lethargica, which is sleeping sickness. Neil Gaiman took that and made it part of the Sandman story, but he said that it was caused by Morpheus being captured and imprisoned. But if you look it up, if you search Google for encephalitis lethargica or sleeping sickness pandemic, it's there, it's a thing, and it happened. So obviously, Morpheus was captured in 1916. So in the years that followed, that's when the pandemic broke out and that's when the world literally went crazy. So the war chap um, who got shell shock, which is what they call PTSD in those days, um, the man who became a living zombie, um, the very important, and this is the name you need to remember, Unity Kincaid, who fell asleep. And while she was asleep, she had a baby. These are seeds that are going to bloom into magnificent, deadly flowers in later books. And that's what Neil Gaiman does better than anyone else. But that whole sleeping sickness thing was real. So what Gaiman does magnificently is tie real events and real people to his fantasy to make it feel that much more real, grounded and scary. For example, when Burgess mentions oh, Alistair and his friends don't laugh at me now, Alistair Crowley, the famous dark magician of that period. So he ties all of this together in his narrative. And when you go back to second reading, knowing this, it will make it a lot, lot deeper, particularly when you meet um, Unity Kincaid further down the line. Right, um, I think I've answered most people's queries and questions on chapter one. Did I bring up anything else that you wanted to ask about before we move on to chapter two. I just wanted to say that the connecting it to the real world events is really cool. I'd like when comics do that. 
a lot. That's just a, a neat a neat device to uh, to work the story in a different way. And I knew all those people were, are going to be important somehow. I I'm, I'm guessing I'm not going to say anything if if you ever reveal it in this episode. You know we'll 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 cover it, but I'm going to hold that too. so. Yeah, because so I, I I'm do gonna think, wait yeah. to get on with it with more because I, I you can tell there's something more coming, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so Dave. I'll just say that I just think that Gaiman chap makes me feel so dumb <laughs> because you know he's knitting fantasy into these real world events, and you're like, how do you have time to research all that and write as well? And it's just. It's amazing. I, I, I did wonder about that, how much it did knit into real world events. Um, but I, I think I'd just like to say about the artwork as well. It blows my mind that this is like late 80s. I mean, I, I am reading the um, recolored edition, so it looks absolutely stunning. Um, but you can tell by the panel layout and everything, you know, if you think about that was starting to change to wasn't the it edges of the borders yeah, yeah yeah exactly that was starting to change a bit but you did have fairly standard paneling before then didn't you and, and i just i was blown away actually how creative uh the panels were i want to piggyback on something that dave said which for the time that this story was told this is before people needed every storyteller to break down all the bits and bite-sized pieces so that they can be spoon fed to you. And I absolutely love the way that does not happen in this. If you don't get it, it's still an enjoyable story. You don't get that particular aspect. There's something for the wise as well as the fool, you know? I appreciate the way, even though this was all the way back then, this is inclusive as hell. It's just a world full of a variety of different types of people. And we're not pointing to that. It's not, see, I have diversity. No, it's just, this is the real world. There are people in it in all different forms. We have different sizes of people, different ages, different colors, different sexualities. I don't know that I like the way they handle the sexualities in all of them, but at least everyone is there. Like everyone is represented. And I appreciate that, especially from someone making stories long before people were pressured into including that type of thing. So and yeah, he, yeah, Damon is brilliant in his storytelling. He did it to and tell a story, not to prove it a point or to have an agenda. That's the right, difference. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't just real world stuff that he's putting in there. It's like folklore from all different cultures being put in here too. And making that feel like it's, these are real creatures. These are real stories based in, in areas you just don't understand. So there's validity to all of them. I appreciated yeah. that. Oh, you're going to love books two onwards. You really are. Mike. Yeah, and so I, I want to um, not necessarily piggyback off what um, Tonya said, but with, I think Dave uh, sort of touched on it with the artwork and things, but two elements I really like is, and anyone who listens to me talk about comics, I always bring this kind of thing up because I'm a simple man, but when you've got uh, sort of text bubbles in different colors and things like that, like an example is in Star Wars with Darth Vader in the newer stuff, They've done it, you know, black bubble, white writing. They do it with Venom in uh, the Spider Boy Marvel comics. In, they do it with Carnage as well, with where it's red and inverted white. And I just find that when I'm reading it, it helps the voice change. When you've got that black with inverted colors, it's like beyond human. It's, it's beyond like Darth Vader and Carnage. When you hear them talk, it's like two voices at once. And that's kind of, you know, for each of those characters, it works in a slightly different way. And with Dream, who is one of the endless and where we don't really know much about this character aside from you know you find out their name uh, morbius and things when you see that they're paneling not only is it inverted colors but it's kind of shaky like across it and it's like i feel like whoever reads it kind of interprets it in their own way but they're still interpreting this ominous dream voice that's otherworldly that's beyond that of a human and i feel like you can kind of interpret that in your own way and i think what adds to that is the paneling i like it when artists aren't afraid to get out of the standard you know, square, 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 like uh, Killing Joke, for example, is one where it sticks to that general rule, but it does it so well and it works perfectly. Whereas in this, you know, every, I'm just looking at like sort of the zoomed out preview of it on um, 
uh, on the uh, tablet and things and it's just like you know some of them are that standard format or almost like uh, playing card sizes then another one they're the circles from dreams perspective and then other ones you've got they're not afraid to experiment with panel work to help it serve the story and I find that both of those elements of the lettering, as well as not being afraid to do different things with the panel work, really helps the world in itself show that this is elevated above the standard of what one would expect from a standard comic book. Beautifully put. The fact that you and Dave both mentioned the colour and the lettering, two aspects of comics which are largely ignored by most critics. They just talk about the writing and the art. And yet here we are talking about a comic book written decades ago which changed the game back then. It really did. Because that lettering, this is one of the first places to do it that way. Those colours, that style of art where they didn't want to be flashy, muscle-bound heroes punching the bad guy. This was as far from that as you can get. And this is a point where I walked away from comics and series like this dragged me kicking and screaming back in. So very great observations from all of you. Absolutely brilliant. Love it. Thank you. Right, chapter two, and I know that Matt's uh, gagging to talk about this. So Matt, what, what did you want to say, brother? I just I would notice that Klein's lettering at the beginning is not his standard style I'm used to, and then he changes it partially way through the book to what that that's that way he does lettering. I mean, it's one of those it's one of those letters that you recognize it's him because of actually the way he draws his letters normally. And talking about the lettering, I just made me think i recognize that i was like wait a minute i thought klein did this whole thing and i went back and was like well I'll be he actually changed what he was doing and how he was doing it yep well spotted absolutely now i know you're gonna want to talk about this chapter as well matt because of uh well cain and abel the house of mysteries as well and i don't know if you remember lucian because he also had his own uh house of mystery style comic book back in uh back in the day as well so let's talk about imperfect hosts and chapter two, and what Morpheus did when he escaped from the Burgess house. Tonya. I really liked that. This was arguably my favorite one. It might be my second favorite. There are two that are really close, but we finally get a look at him. You know, we finally get to see this character design. And I don't know if any of you have seen Only Lovers Left Alive. He gives me an Adam vibe, but a, a little less sexy because he's he's sickly. You know, he's recovering from being trapped for what was it like seventy years. So I like that he's weak after all of this time. I like he doesn't come out full force, and I really enjoyed seeing the fates and the way they played with them and the way they move. Like they moved within the panels where they're just kind of switching and the games that they played and at the end where they're like, we have not helped you. <laughs> I really like that. And this is the one where I realized, oh, this is like in the DC universe, like for real, you know, <laughs> I didn't understand. I didn't know that from the beginning. And I did not read, I did not read um, the preface because I didn't want any spoilers. So this, this is where things just really started coming together for me. And it was very exciting. Um, Mike, your thoughts on chapter two. So yeah, with this, um, obviously Cain and Abel are famous biblical figures, and I vaguely re remembered that. And what I, what I like about both Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore's writing is when they speak about certain elements and they bring in such a wide berth of mythology and other elements, it makes me then go, I know that from something. So I look into it, and now I know the story of uh, Cain and Abel a lot better than I did. And I, I remember I've looked it up before and things, but it's that sort of when you get that kind of uh, into mythologies linking obviously this is sort of dc mythology mixing with uh, sort of biblical mythology as well as lots of other um, elements when you kind of get the merging of those together it's one of those things where if you didn't know the story of cain and abel it doesn't take away from this you you get the gist but if you do go you go i recognize is that them from you know and if you're like me where it's on the fence you're like oh i, I want to look this up and then you look that up and it adds another layer once again you don't have to but you can and i think that's one of the things i like about the the level of detail in in this because although you know i'm not as much of a, a comic aficionado as uh, the rest of you and especially not for dc comics even certain little threads it's just like it's i think you mentioned it before steve it's kind of like whatever your fan level is 
you get rewarded kind of respectively from if you know a certain elements but even if you're at the bottom it doesn't take away from that and i think it's the same with just general knowledge of all kinds of other elements of otherworldly realms and mythology where if you don't know anything about any mythology that's fine you can skate through this it'll be really interesting and on the, the you know rereads it will kind of add more but if you've already got a baseline understanding of how certain cultures and things interpret xyz then once again it adds to it so not only as a comic book fan you get rewarded but also it's just a mythology and in obviously in this context religious either follower or person who has intrigue in it so i really like that element as well and i think that when I think back to it, I go, oh, this story was very much about Cain and Abel. And then just flicking through it again, it's like panel wise, it's not necessarily that much more than uh, than Dream. But because the the way it's kind of done is that this story in part doesn't seem like I was, it, it kind of feels like to begin with, like, oh, this isn't specifically about Dream in particular. But some very key important elements happen to Dream, even if he's not taking up the majority of this issue. And then obviously the Cain and Abel stuff comes a little bit later as being important. So it's just that kind of thing where when something feels like it may not be as connected, it's actually just drawing in, like rooting through uh, plot lines that you aren't aware of yet, which once again is, is something you've benefited from because I've reread this. So I, I've kind of, and I've taken notes and things. So I'm kind of, the things are coming back as I'm even speaking to them as I was when I read it the second time. Um, we're going to talk more about that as well, because uh, yes, <laughs> is the only thing I can say right now. But Matt, obviously, being the comics guru you are, you know that Cain and Abel started off as characters in their own comics, House, House of Mystery and House of Secrets. But um, obviously, you know as well that the whole murderous side of them and linking them to their biblical namesakes was something Alan Moore did in Swamp Thing and Neil Gaiman's taken on because Sandman is a spiritual successor to Swamp Thing. But obviously, tell us about your knowledge of Cain and Abel and what you thought of Chapter 2. Well, it's also a spiritual successor to the horror comics of the 60s and 70s that DC did, because even the three witches are from the witching hour, that DC anthology. So that's, even though they're riffing on the Greek fates, uh, uh, what's it, Clotho, Lachis, and Atro Atropos, you know, it's, it's, it's doing multiple things. And to me, I also thought of, because that, the three fates are also uh, referenced in uh, Macbeth, as the, the three witches around the cauldron also. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on that I guess, like Mike said, if, if you have the knowledge of those other things, it's bringing in other, other, dis other not disciplines, but other stories, other things that uh, you might uh, not always think about. Like for me, when I see Cain and Abel, I just see the DC characters. I mean, of course I know they're based on the, the biblical characters, but because there's a humorous element to them too, as he keeps killing him repeatedly and he always comes back you know and he has the pet i guess the dragon gregory that's a weird humorous thing and it kind of blends the it blurs the lines of horror and and humor because that's all designed to be a little funny you know haha -ha moment uh in those old house of mystery and house of secrets comics and i guess i guess we don't really see them together i'm trying to remember do we don't we really see them in the old days together i don't think we do i think like you said that's Never. a that's a more thing they're yeah. separate uh in the old days uh but you know it fits it fits it's it's a neat you know connection of course we see uh what's the other note i made uh that's i think this is the episode issue we first see uh wesley dodds uh and i think um and i think that's also where brute and glob are mentioned uh and something else i made a note about was uh because I've read it before, it to me gave me foreshadowing for issue eight. There's a line where someone says something about the elderly waiting for death like an old friend. And it made me think of what I know comes at the end. So exactly it was just an that. interesting bit of, of, of foreshadowing that by including that eighth issue connects, adds some connective it's tissue for issue eight to this as a, as a whole kind of a thing. Uh, it does feel disjointed in one way, but at the same time, it it connects the threads in in other ways. But but yeah, I mean, and and you know, it, as a story device, you've got to get he has to go to Cain and Abel to figure out what's happened in order to get his uh, his accoutrement back, as it were. Very well put, exactly that. And again, it's another fine example of Gaiman's breadcrumbs. But I'll talk about that when I get to my section. But obviously, Dave. What did you make of chapter two and what our friends and colleagues have been speaking about so far? Well, I, I 
remember Cain and Abel from Sunday school back in the day, a very long time ago. But these guys show up. I'm like, who who are you? Should I know who you are? I, I and when the dragon shows up, I'm like, he's holding death at death. He's holding dream. And I'm like, what the F is going on here? <laughs> you know, so I was I was a bit lost. And Again, I'm going to go back to just that surprise that this is a late 80s book because it is such a modern, a much more modern way of storytelling, isn't it? It's that decompressed storytelling. It's not, you know, Hulk goes on an adventure uh, to a planet and then comes back and has a cup of tea at the end of the comic or something, you know, and you got all of this in one issue. And here you're like, oh, this, the pacing of it and everything is so... Uh, you know, this must have had a massive influence on everything that came after it, just in, in that pacing. Um, but yeah, I I did have a feeling. And actually, I forgot, I was just leafing through there. And obviously, you get uh, the visit to Arkham Asylum, don't you? So that was, again, a clue. That, oh, right. Okay. So this might be in a, a connected. I was kind of thinking this could be like a parallel DC universe where Arkham Asylum e- exists. Um and uh, I mean, when John D first shows up, it is horrific, isn't it? That uh, artwork there. And I, I can't help but look at, at Dream and think of Robert Smith from The Cure, to be honest. And as he gets his strength back, <laughs> he looks more and more like him, especially that last pa- Actually, no, the last panel he's smiling, so not so much that one. But uh... <laughs> But yeah, kind of enjoyed it, but I think... I'll enjoy it more when I go through it the next time because I didn't really understand. It was like placing all the chess pieces down w- before you've started the game or something. I, I was just not really sure what was going on, if I'm honest. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, you're all saying wonderful things that are just making me grin from ear to ear. Yeah, Cain and Abel uh, originally appeared in the 60s. Uh, Cain in House of Mystery, 175 in 1968, and Abel in House of Secrets, 81 in 1969. But what a lot of people don't know is Lucian, Dreams Librarian, the keeper of the Library of Dreams, also had his own uh, anthology book called Weird Mystery Tales, which came out in 1975. He started in issue 18. Now, the House of Mystery and House of Secrets are mainstays, are staples of the DC Universe. They even appeared in issues of The Brave and the Bold with Batman team and whatever else. But like Matt said, they never appeared together until more brought them together, made them the biblical brothers, had the Cain kill Abel multiple horrible ways, almost every other issue. And then Neil Gaiman just took it up to volume 11. But um, Lucian's home in the comics is literally what you see as Dream's Castle in this issue. So his home, his secret house, his place where he told his strange, weird horror stories was Dream's Castle. And what Gaiman's done is taken those three anthologies, which are again based, as Matt would say, on the wonderful EC horror comics of the 50s as well, um, and made them part of this massive mythology that he's building and connected it to the East Universe. Like issue one had the reality of Encephalitis Lithologica. Issue two ties in to the fantasy and comic book elements. So Gaiman's like weaving all these threads together, which like you say, you just blow your mind and think, well, hang on, how's he doing this? How's he researching this and writing this story in a way that's still fun? Because every single one of you um, is basically fairly new to this story, but you all got something out of it. And even if you didn't understand it, you got it. And you know that these characters are something different to what you've seen in a comic book before so that's hugely hugely important and john d and arkham asylum well as we know will uh bear fruit in later episodes but any other thoughts on what i've said or on what your colleagues have said about chapter two tonya well speaking of hugely important i really wish ria was here so that we could discuss the massive phallic castle that you're referencing (laughs) Yep. Like, that was not subtle. I wonder at all. if that was accidental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she wants to release the dogs, and here we have an opportunity to s- discuss it, and she's not there. I also wanted to talk about one of the panels that I believe is in this one when he's walking away, when Dream is walking away. It's kind of like what Mike was talking about, where they don't have the panels so square and perfect. 
the way you see passage and movement just in this sweeping arch of the way he's leaving. And that was one of the moments that really pulled me in. I can't quite see it, Dave. <laughs> and then the other thing is in the character design, something that Dave talked about, the Robert Smith look, it's also the Eric Draven look. Like it's, it's a classic, just gorgeous goth guy. And it works. It definitely works. What was with the little chicken? Goldie. <laughs> we love Goldie. Goldie. I gorgeous. just didn't get it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you will. Mm. That, that's Spoilers. another breadcrumb. Yeah. Spoilers. No I was just going to say, but... <laughs> I've got a couple of those weird mystery tales issues hidden yeah. somewhere in my stuff. I'll have to dig out. I don't remember him as a Lucian as the host, but. I Something about old comics you didn't, it. yay! Yeah, I, I, certainly I never thought that would ever happen. Is, well, I can't read everything. You oh. know, there's something... What? I, I, it's, it's hard, right? <laughs> We're still stuck in the 50s at some point. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> but it's still lords like that that make us old, real nerdy comic book geeks, like, happy. Little tidbits like that, just, just oh, love it. I, I can definitely say if I had read this when it first came out and i go, oh Cain and Abel and the the witches from Witching Hour and if I'd call it the illusion thing it really just it, it, it's more of a DC Universe series than at the beginning than it is later on I guess Absolutely. and that's and that's such a I think I think colors my perception of um, of what it is coming in you know reading it now as opposed to the first time you know after what it becomes if that that's where sense. i need to touch on something dave said earlier actually because when this launched this was a dc comics title it didn't become vertigo until the mid 40s early 50s that's when vertigo launched and it was this series and um alan Moore something before it that actually led to the creation of vertigo so obviously every subsequent reprinting every collection has been Vertigo until now when it's DC Black Label. But yeah, Vertigo came out of this series. Um, the first Death Mini series, if memory serves, is also DC. It's only the second one and the third book um, at Death's Door that are Vertigo books. So that's something that this series helped usher in. Anyone else? Any more notes on Chapter 2? Just that uh, Matt said how funny it is, you know, Cain and Abel you know, that you got the abusive brother killing, you know, and it's really funny. I think we've got slightly different perspectives on humor, <laughs> especially like the last page. Oh. You know, I felt so sorry for the guy. It's like, you know, it's horrendous. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, but I know he's coming back. I know he's coming back. That's the gag. But that's, that's, that's why it's that's funny. That's a horrendous, coming horrendous endless torturous abusive relationship isn't it that's that's how i but, was reading it in, but that's that. that's that's the lesson though in the in the bi biblical story too is yeah. that's their relationship in the bible and if they're <coughs> endless <coughs> endless <laughs> you know that's the lesson from them you know that doesn't change you know that that's kind of what makes it funny it's how they can go through that same cycle repeating and repeating they're still brothers he's still going to kill him because he's that kind of guy <laughs> But that, that's what kind of makes it, I don't know. It, a very sort of, dark humor, know. but it's humor. It's dark yeah. humor. True, true. Yeah. It's dark yeah. humor. It's not, I mean, and I, I guess to me, to me it works because it, it, it's a repeated, it's not like, you know, he kills him and that's the end of it. And you're like, oh, damn, he just killed his brother. That's it. It's, he comes back and it's a gag on one end, even though it points out to some something, you know, darker and deeper, you know, on another end, but that's things working in two different ways, which is a lot of great storytelling things go both ways. See, it's not just one thing, it can be multiple things. So it's, it's all also, like killing Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, exactly except that we years thing. before, yeah. But it's also yeah. Gaiman's um, literal interpretation and uh, dig at comic book humor and cartoon humor in general. It's him saying, well, hang on, uh, this happens to poor old Wiley Coyote on Tom and Jerry on a weekly basis, and we laugh at it. But when it happens to real people, it ain't so funny, is it? That's also his direct dig at that level of storytelling. So, well spotted all. Now, chapter three. He's a nasty piece of work, mate. Ask anybody. John 
Constantine, one of my favourites. I know that Matt isn't the biggest fan, but you must admit that in this series, the use of songs, the use of things heard in the background, the some things trying to tell you somebody lying. This is one of my favourite chapters. Tonya, what did you think of Dream a Little Dream of Me? I did really enjoy the songs and I had some of them in my head for the few days where I was re reading this. I almost posted one as my Saturday song lyric too. Like it was just really with me that long. I'm not a huge fan of John Constantine. Like I like him, but I, I want to, he just smokes too much. That's basically it. I, I was introduced to him and I thought, oh, I'm going to love this guy. He's hot. He's British. He's so cool. Oh, he smokes too much. Like I can't deal with it. <laughs> There's something very unattractive about that, but it, it goes with the gritty world, but they showed a softer side of him in this and they showed a compassion with dream too, or it's like, oh, he's already caring about humans. That's interesting. Because I would think that after 70 years of imprisonment, he would just be like, I don't care. You know, <laughs> she had my stuff and I'm just going to let her rot to death. I thought it was an interesting character introspection. You know, it's okay. So there's something more to him in there. He has feelings. He's not neutral. I think he wants to be neutral, but he isn't neutral. And I, I liked that glimpse into his personality. Um, yeah, so with this one, I mean, I know next to nothing about John Constantine, and this is going to offend everyone here, but the most I know about Constantine is the Keanu Reeves movie, which I think is banging. I really like that movie. I think it's great. I know everyone here is going to hate me, and I'm okay with that because... It's a good I, film, but he's not John Constantine. That's the no, only thing I well, can that, say. Well, that's it. You know, I know it's going to offend lots of comic book readers, but I'm uh, in, in this one, I'm... I'm doing a Chris Phelps. It's like, yeah, I know. I, I didn't even know about it at all. I read that. I was like, oh, it's, it's that guy that I've heard everyone speak about somewhat. Um, so the John Constantine stuff, I was like, cool. I know more, slightly more about, you know, this cigarette smoking uh, supernatural person. Um, but the thing that I, I like the most about this is um, the concepts, I think. And that's one of the running themes I enjoy the most about um, this, this whole collection is the concepts. I forgot to mention it in chapter one, but it's the, um, when a uh, dream punishes the son of the guy who imprisoned him um, into endless waking. And it's horrendous. The idea of just having a nightmare and then you wake up and then you're still in the nightmare and that forever is that's horrendous. And that's such a cool idea. And in this, when you get the kind of living dream matter and when you get the, the girlfriend of John doing the drug, but the drug is his sand pouch. So she's kind of like doing the drug of dreams. And whenever you get beings uh, or humans doing like, Drugs and religion are two concepts that very much intrigue me in very different ways. And so when I see it in media that I'm consuming, that they've got elements like um, this is a very flawed series in many ways, True Blood. Uh, I watched all of that. And that's the idea that in that humans take V and then it's like a hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic drug. And that's a very intriguing concept to me because I was like, I've never thought about what would happen if a human ingested vampire blood aside from when they're getting turned. So that was quite interesting. And in this, it was like, oh, what would happen if a human did consume this you know uh this matter that is a you know a tool of a god basically what what happens to a person when that happens and it's you know he mentions in this issue and in other ones when things aren't meant to be used for that purpose you know he mentions it with the ruby later on but it's where these nightmarish pun intended things happen and when you've got this house and when you've got constantine when he flicks the light switch because he touches some of this living matter because it's created by this bizarro world you know her taking this dream drug and things and everything happening he falls into a dream immediately and you see him falling and stuff and then morbius touches him and he's like oh what huh? what's happening and he's like yeah you, you basically touched it and you got kind of sucked into it in a way those elements were so intriguing to me that i reread this this is probably my favorite i think of all of them because for me it felt a lot like with miracle man there are those kind of oh shit moments one of them that I remember the most vividly is, and this isn't a spoiler, but this is when a certain character grabs two people and just slams them together. And you just turn the page, you're like, holy. And you, it's just, you know, there's a small little explosion of someone, you know, um, in end of chapter one or chapter two. I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's intense. But when I saw this dream house made out of flesh and someone doing it, I was just like, that's horrendous while when like I'm bouncing off what Tonya said, the way that he handles her and he's like, she's not a bad person. She didn't do this in a horrible way. She's just to be a derogatory. She's a misguided junkie. And so in that realm, he is very forgiving of her and he gives her this beautiful 
kind of end that he can't save her but he can give her that and they give some insight into like the heart of dream but also more insight into what his powers are because we still don't really know we've got a smidge of it from the first one where he goes into dreams eat stuff can grab stuff and then he uses it to travel but aside from that we don't really know what it is and that's what this kind of whole volume is about and i think this really cleverly shows what he has control over and what can happen to these these elements that humans don't fully understand when someone who isn't an endless has some degree of control over them. I spoke a lot then. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I love that one. That was my favorite uh, chapter. All of it excellent. well worth saying, and you're saving me saying a lot of stuff because you said it brilliantly. Thanks, Mike. Matt, your thoughts, sir? Well, well, I'll start with saying that after hearing your episode of uh, Superhero Sajami with John Constantine and uh, finally getting through the entire Swamp Thing run by Alan Moore, I've come around some on John Constantine, so he's not as distasteful as he would have been years ago. Um, and uh, one would think I would have loved him right off the bat, having been a huge police fan as a teenager, that somebody based on Sting would have been like my thing, right? But whatever. It wasn't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think I think what Tanya mentioned about the characters, and there's a, a sensitivity there to both of them that you don't see uh, that that I think overall is is not as present in the majority of this volume as I personally would like to see. Um, that that that's something that's really important to what I like about stories and characters and that sort of thing, which is why I gravitate towards issue eight. Uh, but uh, technically, I, I made a couple notes. Uh, you mentioned the music, and yeah, the music, all the different songs. That's a great way of. Uh, uh, function of func functioning as an element in the story as well as uh, a way of telling the reader what's going on without telling the reader kind of what's going on so that you're he you're sort of figuring out the same way that Constantine is like why do I keep having these songs in my head about dreams and all this stuff uh, and then I also made a note about the uh, the very first page uh, how we how we meet uh, Rachel and we get her description and then we don't get her actually in the meat of the story till Constantine and Morpheus find her and I thought that was uh, I really just like technically how that was done uh, I thought that was really really effective and I, I just I like that and then that leads directly into that sort of uh, sensitive uh, aspect of both of the characters and then when Constantine really shows his vulnerable side when he says can you help me with the nightmares from what happened in Newcastle and you're like oh you know he he actually you actually feel like he he finds somebody to ask to get help and that's something you don't usually in my experience with the character you don't see him asking for help for those types of things hey Swampy we need you to save the world yeah sure but I need I need I need help personally because of me and how I'm damaged inside. Can you can you help me? You know. And it was also cute when he said maybe I would introduce you to the, introduce you to the big green guy, meaning Swamp Thing, which is a funny little uh, uh, line that you know some people are like the Hulk. What? No, he's Swamp Thing. But <laughs> that's me on that issue. <laughs> Brilliant, Dave. Your thoughts, sir? I love this issue. Um, I do like Constantine as a character. Um, I can recommend, Mike, if you watch the TV series, it is so, so much better than the movie. Um, really, really good watch. Uh, but even though I loved it, I had, I had a couple of problems with it. But ultimately, the feeling uh, was just stomach-churning sadness, to be honest. You know, with what he's gone through there, when you see... Uh, great artwork and everything. When you see the de decay, well, not decayed, but you know, the it is almost a decayed body, isn't it? Because she's in this kind of dream world uh, all the time. And it, it was just unbelievable sadness because you could see that he had genuine feelings for her. And it obviously hadn't worked out, but that doesn't mean he, he still doesn't uh, have a soft spot for her. I think the, 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 the problem I had with it uh, it was just a little nitpicky thing, but when he, he sees, uh, you know, Mad Hetty and, you know, she's knocking on the window and she tells him, you know, about the um, Morpheus's back 
and he said, I've got it here. He says, the Sandman's a fairy story. You tell your kids to get them off to sleep. And it's like, but when he turns up, he, he says, uh, you know, Dream just says, uh, John Constantine, I presume. And he's like, well, I'm not Dr. Livingston. And then they're straight into it. They're off for an adventure to find the pouch again. And it, he just swallows it whole. It just from going from, no, he's a fairy story to, oh, let's let's go off. I, I, I don't know. I just felt that was a little bit clunky, but that doesn't detract from how great I thought this issue was. And again, some of the artwork when you get into that dream space, uh, this is, I think, where you start to open the door a little bit to the horror. Um, and I thought it was it was fantastic. So, yeah, loved it. Again, once you've read as much Constantine as I have, you realise that that is so Constantine. Like, hang on, that's bollocks until, oh, okay, so you're real. Fair enough, let's just go with it. That's his entire life. Because if it wasn't, he would be locked in Ravenscar Asylum permanently, not just when he feels like he can't handle life anymore. Mm. Um, so that's actually one of the best and most um, consistent aspects of John because he has to be flexible. If he was the girder, he'd be blown down in the wind. He's got to be the blade of grass. And whichever way the wind blows, he's got to flow about. Otherwise, he'd be finished. So I can see your frustration, but that is very constant. Yeah, I think if there was just a literally a little word balloon, which was, oh, go figure, or something like, oh, I guess she was right, or something like that, I yeah. I, I think yeah. I'd have been happier with that. But like you say, it's, it's a very small point in the in the grand scheme of things. But I love what you said about the first true horror, because you're right, we've had aspects of horror in the first two chapters, but this was like the first inklings and, well... We still got issue six and seven to talk about, so we'll come to those. But I say this is true horror. But everything else I wanted to say about this, the notes I've made, you've all covered. So I'm happy. And if anything, anyone else got anything else to say about Dream a Little Dream of Me before we move on? The yeah, Matt. Um, I thought that the Constantine thing, after all we know he's experienced with Swamp Thing and the world he came from, it makes perfect sense that he just to be like, oh well, well of course you are. Oh, well, of course you are. Of course, your dream incarnated. Of course, you are. So I, I didn't even think about that, but it was interesting when you said it, Dave. I thought, oh well, why wouldn't he? Oh, that makes sense. The other thing was, uh, uh, you were talking. Who was talking about death? I think it was Mike. I was thinking of the juxtaposition of the sadness of the death, and maybe it's Dave in the in this issue, um, and how you compare that to um, issue eight. And I don't mean to keep bringing up issue eight, but I'll just say right now it's my favorite issue of the of the of this volume. But I, I keep seeing things connections to it. So like when you said that about about death and how sad it is, and then there's a and it's a gross sadness. It's horrible. It's just terrible, you know. But then at the end, it's death is it's all death. But then there's the other side of it that we get with the character that's very different from from this so I, I just saw the connection when to say something thanks mm. again that was there on purpose yeah but i can see it being frustrating for new readers who aren't as nerdy as and uh as comic powered as matt and myself so i do get your point dave definitely but yeah that's so him absolutely hello so we're chatting sandman yay um I am very excited to be talking about Sandman and I can't wait to hear what everybody has to say. It's going to be such a good chat. Uh, I think you're all going to have loads of fun talking about it. I'm really sad that I'm not there, but Sandman. Okay, so when I think about books that have had a profound effect on me, the first one I always think of is Sandman. It's something that when I was younger, I used to sneak, sneak into my older brother's room how to find some graphic novels and Sandman was one of the very first ones that I came across. When I opened it little did I know a world that I was about to expose myself to that I was going to experience this whole new world a whole new way of storytelling that I had never experienced before in novels or or comics. You know and Sandman is just that it's a whole new way of telling stories. It's 
complex and it treats its readers with respect and intelligence. It's, you know, the whole thing, the, the, the writing, the drawing, everything about it, you know, it's smart, it's terrifying, so scary, it's absolutely bonkers, and it's all comforting, all in the same, all in the same book, it's just amazing. It allows you to feel all of these complex emotions about human life. It also has one of my first ever comic book crushes, which is Death. I mean, all of the characters in Sandman are amazing, but let's be honest, Death is the damn best. And it, the thing about it as well, it's also what I love about comics. It's a book that explores so many different themes and it offers you, the reader, something new. It takes its time and it asks questions. You know, it asks you, what is it to be alive? Both us as humans and for the Endless and the other characters that we see throughout Sandman. It, it asks us to think about, you know, what is it to, to dream, to have desires, to destroy things? Who are we as human beings? And just, you know, just as human beings, who are we being human beings? And the whole story is so powerful. It's an absolute clear vision of what Neil Gaiman wants to tell us. And that's why it works so well as a complete whole. It's a story about stories. And we, as human beings, we are just stories. That's all we are, just stories. So I'm not sure this is elo as eloquent as uh, the audio I recorded for the podcast. Hopefully it makes some sort of sense. I had to listen back and remember what I said because I'm terrible at making notes. But I really hope everybody's had a wonderful time talking about it. I hope so many people get to experience Sandman who haven't. And if you have, I hope we get loads of chats. Please come engage with us online to talk about it. And I hope we get to talk about it some more. So thank you. Thanks for having me on. Bye. Right. Move on to chapter four then. A hope in hell and uh, talk about breadcrumbs. Whoo. This single 20 page comic leads to an entire six issue saga, which is a complete book of one of the Sandman episodes. But we'll talk about that if and when we get to it. Let's talk about the Demon Etrigan. Let's talk about Nada. Let's talk about Lucifer. Let's talk about Dreams, Helmet, and the Triumvirate of Hell. Tonya. I absolutely love this one. This is the other contender for favorite here. There was so much in this, and it felt like just a short period of time and questions that they didn't answer, but I mean, they, they posed so brilliantly, like why did they have to go by Nada? Who is Nada? How is Nada so important to, to dream that he cares enough to say, I still love you, but whatever happened between them had to be powerful enough. Like, it, it feels like it had to be something heartbreaking because why else, after showing that compassion in the previous issue, why was someone that he loves, would he be okay with that punishment, that continued punishment after going face to face with the pleading, please end my suffering. So that makes me want to know all about that situation and they don't go back to it at all. <laughs> There's also- They will. They will? Oh yes. I, why? Why give me that little taste and then not give me any information about it? And they spent like an entire page on it. Like it was so clearly, this is important, but we're not going to tell you why, you know? <laughs> so it, it made me want to know more about that history. What happened between them? Who is not a, who is not a to dream? And then we have the Lucifer part of it, which the first panel to me looked like David Bowie, but I don't know if that was intentional or not. <laughs> this is definitely one that I thought didn't spoon feed the audience. It's like there's the panel when they're doing when they're doing the battle, okay? And then Dream changes tactics. And Lucifer's like, mm. like no words, it's just an expression. They're playing a chess match, and Lucifer sees, oh. He's three steps ahead. He's going to win. Like, you know, right. We already know that he's going to win or that, you know, eventually he's going to be triumphant here. But in that panel, without a word, it is communicated. He is so 
ahead of the game in this battle. Just wait and see what happens. And I love that they never explain it. They never go back and say, he knew right here that he was three steps ahead. Because they do that in television and movies all the time now, where it's like, let's go back and explain it for the people who didn't catch it. No, thank you for not explaining it. I loved it. And I'm going to shut up about it so other people have a chance no, to talk. No, that was beautiful. You spotted some consumer storytelling. And to read this for the first time and get little nuances like that, kudos. Love it. Thank you. Mike. Hello there. Um, I want to clarify anyone who's uh, watching the video, or any of you guys, I'm, when I'm looking down, I am flicking through panels on uh, my tablet of Sandman and also reading, rereading over my notes because just when certain individuals are speaking about parts, you know, um, like when uh, Tonya said about looking like Bowie, I did think that. I, I thought that when I was just flicking through recently, but I was just with how I, a lot. Mike, of... we know you're reading Star Wars comics. We know you're <laughs> just reading Star at the same Wars time. Yeah. Was well, actually funny. I do normally have a couple around me. I do. I do normally have a few around me. This is where I do. Oh, my really? <laughs> well, you can see there's a Lego Falcon behind me. But um, what, one of the things with uh, Hell, um, I always like seeing different artists and creators' interpretations of both Heaven and Hell. Hell more so. I'm I'm always more intrigued by um, sort of the darker elements of life uh, in a, in a lot of the, the media that i consume any weird dark realms and things and like one panel in particular i really like is the double page spread uh, where you just it could be just a poster you if you even if you took away the dialogue or even if you keep the dialogue because the dialogue's quite funny that's the kind of the humor of it where it's almost like you know it zooms in and it's like okay so where do you want to see your helmet and then it zooms out and it's just hordes and miles of monsters and every monster looks quite different to themselves but they're all someone's own version of what a demon would be or what true fear would be but there's just sprinklings of that and i've just been looking at that almost the entire time that tony was talking just zooming in on different elements and i remember when i read it the first time i was on that page for probably about five minutes i was like i don't care if any of these creatures ever show up again i just love all the weirdness and bizarreness of them all um so that's one thing i really liked about the imagery and the only other thing i'll say about this issue apart from you know i really liked it was my favorite part is one of my favorite concepts uh, from this um, volume and it's the the wood of suicide I think that's very in in literally a, almost what equates to a throwaway few panels which is something which a lot of people probably read and be like oh that's kind of cool move on I feel like that concept in itself you could write a whole book on the concept of you know suicide uh you know when you go into the afterlife you become this kind of dying tree and all these like there's so many that one thing that's on like a, a page is it literally starts and ends the, the mention of that in a page and then you've just got the final thing said before it moves on to the next thing is um where dream says you know um the wood of suicide has changed since my last visit to hell i remember it as a tiny grove now it resembles a forest hell is changing I was like, Jesus, that is heavy. Like, you isolate that out of anything else included in this whole uh, volume of comics. And it's like, that is heavy while also just so powerful in so many ways. And it doesn't dwell on it. It doesn't, as to leading off Tonya's point, it doesn't make a big fuss about it. It's just, here's a thing. And it's like, the more I think about that and unravel that concept, although I don't believe in an afterlife in the, in the standard sort of uh, many of the biblical senses, I the idea of that, be it as a metaphor or what actually happens to you i think is such an intriguing idea of just how a, an afterlife could visually convey what could happen to one soul if you commit suicide which is known to be one of the the worst sins one can do so it's just i i loved both the variety of the demons and the interpretation of hell in itself while also throwing in some of these concepts which are no, no one who started reading Sandman was like, you know what I'm interested by is concepts about hell and souls in the afterlife. You just, and in this, it's just, oh, here's a page and we move on to the story. And you're like, wait, what was that back there? Wait, you're, like, you're moving on the story. Like, what's going on over there? And you can just see things in the background. And that's one thing that I know more in game and share a lot in common where I'm getting into the, uh, the, the more in the game and verses, you know, Miracle Man and with this and the other things I'm going to be venturing into. It's the more that, and it's one thing I always I think things back to Star Wars constantly, but the way I'd mirror it is the cantina scene is very iconic in Star Wars. There's a billion things going on in that scene, most for one second at a time. And although that moment isn't explicit, <laughs> nice Dave, uh, if, although that minute isn't, that moment or frame isn't explicitly important to the story 
or the journey that you're being told, the narrative, the amount it adds to the law of the world makes someone want to revisit the world itself, which is what kind of drags me into Sandman and things more and more, is the concepts behind them, less so than the explicit story of Morbius himself. Uh, so I thought I'd add that. Beautiful. That was a mic drop moment. Lovely. Oh, I'm so proud. My children. Matt. Well, well first, um, I can't help but uh, mention the time Mike and I were speaking and we were talking about the time Darth Vader had the coffee cup, which seems so incongruous with the character. But Dave's got the coffee cup, so I guess it happened. I don't know. Um, uh, are we all decided then that Satan looks like... Uh, David Bowie, are we agreed then? Oh, because he I had the exact is. same, uh, the exact same uh, thing. I saw that page. I was like, David Bowie, what the hell? <laughs> Literally, um, and it made me think of, uh, you know, his nickname, the th <laughs> the Thin White Duke. That fits the idea of that interpretation of Lucifer, as well as uh, it made me think about the movie. Even though it's about an alien, a man who fell to Earth, it still has that same sort of concept of. Uh, Satan falling from uh, heaven to, to hell, falling to earth. Um, and then, uh, Mike, what you were saying about the uh, suicide, uh, aspect of the suicide and, and, and the trees, I had the same sort of uh, moment, but it kind of went more of a uh, lines of just think about what he's saying about the world in general, uh, what what's happening in the world in general that, that would cause more people to commit suicide now, as opposed to, you know, then uh, 1916, I guess. Well, I, well, I don't know. We don't actually get to find out, I guess, when he last visited hell. Um, it's not told. And if it's, if it is told Steve, tell me, cause I don't, I don't know, I guess. Oh, I'm right. Um, so whenever that was, the world's changed a whole lot. Uh, and that, that to me was a very interesting thing. And I think it's also very clever that he chose it to be a forest since one of the ways that Judas Iscariot was supposed to have killed himself was by hanging on a tree. So I can only hope that comes back, especially since Steve is pointing at me like I'm the man. So I'm going to say that that was uh, – oh, oh, and oh, the final thing about this – I forgot this was episode – a hope in hell. I really love that Dream's um, winning move is is hope, and that there's always hope, no matter what. Uh, if you if you can hold on to that hope, that's what you know. We're gonna often bring you through. Something that we all like about characters like Superman is the sense of hope that as long as there's a there's hope, you can you can push forward when you lose all hope that's really your sign of uh defeat so i really like that what that said about i guess life and positivity and how to uh look at things and don't you know i guess juxtapose with the suicide trees you know don't give in to uh, uh despair there's always hope no matter how bad it seems because you don't want to end up as a tree in the suicide forest but Thanks. It's, you're doing my job for me. I've got almost nothing left to say. Dave, blow my mind. Blow your mind. Well, have you ever seen that meme of Morgan Freeman? And it says at the bottom, you've just read this in my, in my voice. voice. Yes. <laughs> well, I am totally reading uh, uh, Lucifer's voice as David Bowie. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I heard in my head when I was reading these lines. Honestly, I, I feel like we could have a book club on this issue it is so so dense and and from the marvel universe one of my favorites is iliana rasputin or magic you know when she goes through limbo and you get this dense you know array of these different demon designs and and what have you and so it, it felt familiar to me even though it's you know different artists and, and some of it, yeah some of the artwork in this is just phenomenal um there's one in particular um just full page and just unbelievable um not sure i was a massive fan of the you know the the uh design where the guy the demon who's got his mask has got the suspenders on and everything i think it was a, a little bit of comedy thrown in there potentially but uh i thought everything else was so thought-provoking 
And one of the things in all my years on the planet I've not stopped to think about is that if you believe in a thing such as hell, that it's changing, I guess without actively thinking about it, I've just had it in my head that it's this static thing. And he he keeps making a point of it, how, you know, it's changing. And absolutely to Matt's point, I... It made me sad as well, you know, because he was saying about, you know, this little wood before, you know, and, and now it's thriving and you're like, oh God, all those people, you know, it, it just makes you really, really think. So yeah, again, can't really say anything bad about it. Um, just, yeah, great issue. It, it's also the exact opposite of what happens on earth with deforestation in hell it's the only place you get more trees through something terrible whereas here we get less trees through something terrible just a opposite mm-hmm. side of the kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah spot on uh, all points that i no longer need to make thank you all you're wonderful and i love you one thing i do want to say though is that um it's A wonderful thing that you brought up was particularly with hell growing and changing because one of the things that Moore did in Swamp Thing, which again, this is a complete spiritual successor to, is state the point that uh, faith and religion always says to you that um, if you repent and if you forgive yourself, you can make your way back to heaven. But what Alan Moore twisted and put turned on its ass was that everyone who's in hell deserves to be because that's what they think they deserve and when you put that into perspective that everyone in hell is there because that's where they think they deserve to be that literally again makes you think of oh hang on so if i'm not totally forgiving myself if i haven't totally repented i will go to hell because i do honestly believe that that's where i should be and the whole thing with the triumvirate where lucifer says that something happened that changed the landscape of hell forever. That was the American Gothic saga and Alan Moore's Swamp Thing where the great darkness came and the great hand came and they joined as one. And now in the corner of hell, a flower blossoms and that makes hell even darker. While in the brightest part, the most beautiful part of heaven, a serpent coils, which makes the brightness that much brighter. And that is all a continuation of this one massive universe that these two legendary writers have created so brilliant observations from all of you again oh, i'm loving this this is this is great so we're halfway through uh anything else to add about hope in hell or should we move on to passengers tonya so first off it sounds like i have some more reading to do with everything you were just referencing <laughs> but does, about, this, she, <laughs> <laughs> about this issue in particular I forgot to mention how much I love the way he shows up in hell without his power. You're like, he's so weak at this point. He shows up and he's just like, give me my stuff. (laughs) He's just not even worried. And he shows no weakness. And yet, even though he could arguably be outmatched in this game, it's his mind that wins it. It's not any kind of physical power, it's his mind. And on top of that, he beats hell with hope on a universal scale because they all just part you know just he he beats it with hope in that in that battle and then their dreams of heaven which is also about hope so it's brilliantly titled and they i love the way they pull it all the way through and now i think after hearing everyone's discussion i think this one is my favorite issue of the entire series um i just want to ask actually you and matt specifically is the um the demon, Merlin's demon, the half-man, Etrigan, is he, is he in other things? Because the reason that makes me think he is, uh, not just in this, but in older stuff, is because he's the only creature in this issue that has that colour scheme. And it's very much the popping 60s kind of... Um, that, that 60s thing, especially the bright yellow of it. And I was just looking at the blue of his attire and the red of his attire doesn't match any other colour palette in... The whole issue really and it just made me think of 60s or golden age era stuff i just i was curious if, if they are from the golden age the lloyd bronze age it's a jack kirby creation early 70s when he came back to dc from marvel like was it 70 
72, 71, 72, when he came over and created the new gods and fourth world and all that, and did his, his Sandman series, uh, Etrigan the Demon was a character he created too. So, and he's been around in the mystical area of the DC universe for a long time. He's a big part of uh, Justice League Dark and Swamp Thing. He's in a lot of Swamp Thing stuff. Like Steve said, they go to hell in the Swamp Thing series. He's in that. He's even in it earlier because in the first volume of Saga, the Swamp Thing that's collected, he's in one of those stories where he helps get rid of some nasty. So he's been around a for a long time. King. There you go. There Another you go. Jack Kirby creation. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Etrigan is a huge part of the DC universe, particularly the uh, supernatural side of it. And uh, yeah, guys, um, once you finish Sandman, it's less. It's not 75 issues. It's about 50 odd. Alan Moore Swamp Thing should be your next port of call because you'll read that and think, huh, Gaiman, you tricky little devil. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's one story. It's literally one story. But um, whereas something was a lot more tied to the DC universe. Gaiman goes off into literature with a capital L. And when he starts bringing in real characters that existed in history and makes them part of his story of dreams, that's when this book just becomes something else. This, this book is the tip of the iceberg. This is world building and it's beautiful. It's wonderful. But honestly, and I love this book, it's the worst Sandman book. And it's brilliant. You guys, oh, I'm so jealous that you're reading this for the first time because you've got so much to see. Right, chapter five, Passengers, Arkham Asylum, Scarecrow, Mr. Miracle, The Martian Manhunter, The Justice League and Justice League International, things that Matt and I love very, very much, Twisted and Darkened. Tonya, what did you think of this very strange little segue episode? Oh, this one was was very strange because it felt like we were being pulled back into more DC stuff. I like seeing the Scarecrow though. He's he's entertaining. And he had some important lines, I thought. You know, you we all come back. And I felt like that was a breadcrumb. And then I think this is where it occurred to me that being of mixed race, you don't see a lot of mixed race characters in comic books, period, or any kind of literature. But it occurred to me who this guy was, who John D was, and he's mixed. You can't tell because he's just a bloody mess, but <laughs> he is a mixed race character from the created from the people in the first issue. Also, what I thought was really interesting is the way Martian Manhunter sees Dream. So I, you know, I've talked about his look a lot and just how attractive he was to me in particular, and I think it was intentional to make him like this, but then we see from Martian Manhunter's perspective, he looks completely different. And that makes me start wondering if we just see him in an, in an image that appeals to us. You know what I mean? And, and I, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but it seemed like this is how he sees him and it's the exact same person. You know, again, what Mike mentioned with the the way they do the lettering. So, you know, yeah, I'm not, my eyes aren't playing tricks with me. This is him, but this is how he sees him. And I don't know, that was just very interesting. To me. That was the most interesting thing about this issue to me was that element right there. And I know it was just a throwaway thing, but I feel like, I don't know, it was, it was very poignant to me. It was not a throwaway thing at all. And it was a brilliant piece of observation. I ask you now, when we finish this show, to go back to where he meets Nada and look at how she sees yeah. Dream. Right. That's all I have to say on the matter for now. Yeah, I definitely noted that. It was like, yeah. huh. And again, uh -huh. it was the lettering that tells you, like they're telling, they're showing you, they're showing, not telling, and that it's just brilliant the way they handle it. Beautifully observed. Mr. Burton. So yeah, with with this one, I this is where it started to lose me a little bit um i would say more so the next issue i i have a lot of things to say about the next issue um but this one was one where because it veered away from there was the it was more so about dr destiny 
you know, he, he took up a lot more of the, the, the screen time of this one. And when I, when, the parts that I see what Morbius Dream is up to, it's very interesting. His, you know, I know who Martian Man, Manhunter is, uh, mainly from the Justice League cartoons on Cartoon Network and stuff. That's my baseline of DC knowledge for most things. That and Teen Titans, that was banging. Um, so when I saw him, and I noted the thing that, uh, that Tonya said as well, but I didn't, I wouldn't have put it so eloquently. So I'm glad she got to that point before me. Um, so the, the dream stuff, I, I liked it with him, but I just found that the parts in the car with Dr. Destiny and um, Rosemary, I'm sure there is a lot more to it and it's probably a breadcrumb that will pay off more so in the future. But this was kind of how I felt about the worst parts of Miracle Man, the Golden Age, which was it just felt like either it's trying to make a point that I'm just not getting or that I've got the point. It's just taking a bit too long to get there. Like almost for me as an individual, they could have almost taken like a whole page or two out of this comic, this issue in particular with Dr. Destiny. And it would have actually improved it for me personally, just because where I've got no understanding of Dr. Destiny or anything. I was like, okay, clearly, you know, I would be, I would have been very surprised if he looked the way he did was in Arkham Asylum and turned out he was a nice guy. You know, it's normally when people look a certain way in comics, it's usually a tell of something, you know, which, as we're getting on, uh, you know, Monday, it's time trying to get out of that. And now people use it a lot of the time. The really good looking person is actually the baddie, blah. But in this time, it's like, okay, I know he's bad. He's come out of Arkham. So he's going to do something awful to this person, clearly. And so I just found a lot of the conversation and her kind of believing in him and stuff. I was like, I don't, I don't really buy it. And then she just, then she gets killed anyway. And I'm like, well, I can't, you know, I saw that that was coming. And for me, just the parts with him just really fell flat and took away. It felt like a spin-off episode for me. But for me, I was just like, I don't, I, I barely know the character who, you know, the titular character. I don't need, I want as little information as anything else as possible. You know, in the first issue, I really liked it because it was feeding into his powers and it was giving dreaming like examples and comparing them to how he impacted the world when he wasn't kind of dream managing in a sense. So when it wasn't about him in particular, it was a sort of tertiary or secondary of what his impact was. Whereas with this in particular, it just didn't land for me that much with, with him. Um, so I started, this is actually the part where I then read the next one and I stopped and I, this was months ago. Uh, and then I started again uh, a couple of weeks ago to get through it again. And then I remember getting to this this and the next issue and remembering why I kind of my interest waned a little bit, but that's more so for the next issue. But yeah, it was all right. I, I enjoyed it somewhat, but yeah, good things to take out of it. All, all valid points. Absolutely. Matt. Um, as you, as Mike said, what he was saying about Dr. Destiny and knowing he was going to be the bad guy, I will point out that sometimes the Joker doesn't kill you because it's funnier if he doesn't kill you. But uh, for me, that I mean, I, I like the, the the sense that you know he is unhinged, so you don't really know what he's gonna do, and then you learn. It's just interesting to see what the, the lady in the car says to try to play along to try to help herself. I, I, I felt it built. I felt to me technically uh, and functioning this way, it built up the tension to where finally, when it does happen, it's like. Oh, well, shit, he killed her. I thought he was not going to kill. I mean, I really thought for a few minutes he wasn't going to do it. Damn, because you, you're you you're instinctively pulling for that person. It's not just like, you know, there's a gun, up oh, and it's over. He, he drew it out in order to make you feel something bad for her. And he and it, he, sometimes you have to do it in order to to make it work. You have to really pull on the, the strings, at least. That, that's how I took that. Um, all the DC stuff really just brings it more back into the... the the dc universe and it's not simply uh uh the sandman universe and then uh the uh jack kirby's all over this book huh we have etrigan scott free granny goodness and all the references to uh what happened with scott uh, on apocalypse and that's it that that's that that was my thoughts on the issue i just it was a connected piece that moved the story along once again connecting everything together the the that sandman is part of this universe and the dc universe and he's not separate really yet and i guess he's always not separate but it's game and trying to figure out how to uh how to tell this story and connect it to all these bits and pieces that i i do find uh interesting 
how it all works and to see, you know, little bits and little things that you go, oh, Scott Free, his name, that's clever, yada, yada, that sort of thing. So to see all those things brought back. Right. I'm going to try and remember all my thoughts here, but I, I guess I felt like Scott Free, his name, I, I didn't think it was clever. I thought, oh, this is like Solo, how he gets his name in the movie Solo. <laughs> you know? Oh, you're on your own? Oh, well, let's make you Han Solo then. More or less was. <laughs> yeah, that, so, that's the fourth word. Because you know Scott Free's Mr. Miracle, or did you not know that? I didn't know that. So ah, I didn't okay. know who... Uh, for me, this this... This issue was just a bit lumpy, and I'm not sure if that's because it wasn't for me. It was almost like a fan service issue. You've got the, like you say, you've got Martian Manhunter, you've got Granny Goodness in there. And for me, it was a lot of a lot of filler uh, that I didn't need. Even I think Scarecrow being in there, I think played a little function. You know, I mean, I don't know how does Arkham Asylum employ people. You know, the amount of people who get killed off there is, is unbelievable. With John D's character, I think he's kind of, the way he's drawn, he's almost like pathetic. He's not, he's not monstrous. It's more like you feel sorry for him. Like, what has happened to this person? And so I was actually more with Matt then Mike was saying, oh, he's clearly he was going to kill her. I was suckered right in there. I was like, you know what? Maybe he's, he's in this situation. I don't know anything about him. Maybe he's just, you know, he's unlucky to be in the situation that he was. He's, he doesn't seem, we haven't seen him be bad. You know, he, he's had this bit of interaction with Scarecrow. Scarecrow's obviously killed this person. And he's like, haha, very funny. But he's trying to escape. And then again, it, I thought it was sickening him when he shoots her. I was just like, holy shit. So that left its mark on me as the issue, you know. When, so when I think of this issue, I think of that. But yeah, to get to that point, I, I just thought it was it was unnecessary cameos for me that didn't necessarily drive the story forward. So still enjoyed the issue, just not one of my favorites, I wouldn't say. It all brilliant points. Well said, each and every one of you. Now, for this, I have to go back to, obviously, I was there. I've still got these as individual issues, not as graphic novels. So I remember the infamous letters pages from this period. Now, by issue five, um, the story was already doing fantastically well by a word of mouth. People were saying, oh, my God, you've never read a comic like this. You need to read this. This is so different. This is so, um, if you ever thought you'd never get another Swamp Thing like comic again, you need to read this. But sales still weren't quite hitting the mark. And Gaiman said it in years since that he did need to shoehorn some of these DC characters in to try and boost and try and get some more readers on board. So for people like Matt and I, seeing Scott Free and Barda and New Genesis and Apocalypse and all those, it was just, yeah, great. He's bringing the DC universe more into it. But for new readers like yourself, I just thinking, well, hang on, what's the point of this? And really, it was just to show that John D might not be without hope, but it would be a long time coming. And if he was prepared to do that to this woman who did was nothing but nice to him, he gave her his husband's coat, gave her the husband's coat, and was was genuine. What could he do if he got that ruby to Morpheus? It was building his threat, and we know that. As a villain, he's probably, I'm sure Matt would agree, one of the most two-dimensional, world domination, classic Bronze Age villains of all time. And this series changed that. It made him something completely different, insane, dangerous, pathetic, and different. He was an all different kind of villain. I mean, and he was one of the first to do that. Before this, villains were villains. They monologued. They got their asses handed to them. This was different. And I think for that reason, I, I still do like this issue, but it is, again, in many ways, the weakest one, but for a reason. And um, that's why. So I hope that's helped take some of the opinions. And, and no, no, maybe I, I think that's fantastic bit. insight because, again, when you're reading it, you know, so many years after in a collected format on nice glossy paper, you miss that context of as yeah. it was coming out. And, and of course, sales, you know, is a very real thing, isn't it? So, you know, I, that explains it to me why 
those needless cameos from from my perspective are, are there. No, brilliant. And it was also to touch on Tonya's point, another way to show Morpheus's power and his range. That yes, we know him on Earth, but holy shit, they knew him on Mars. This is to show this isn't just a dream. This is the dream. And that was vitally important. Mm. Right. Let's get to the real horror of the situation. And this is an episode that's going to fascinate me how they translate this to TV, because this is pure physical horror, body horror, psychological horror, and everything in between. This is chapter six, 24 hours. One of the single greatest horror comics ever created because it was pure horror. Other horror comics are just like monsters and blood. This was something different. Tonya, I know you're going to have thoughts on this one. (laughs) Yes, I have thoughts. I do think that they did a nice job of telling this story with the hour marks because, you know, of course it's named that way. But what they do is they draw us into first... I don't remember the waitress's name, but the way she has her happy, happily ever after fantasies about each of the characters here. So first, we're getting her idea about each of these people and then what they should be and what they could be. So that introduces us to the characters and gives us a way to think about them. But then we get this strange, there is this one panel that I thought was really cool, the way they they mirrored the motion so you could see this is happening at the same time that this, you just saw this, but then this was happening at the same time. So you see the magic happening. And I wasn't really that worried about these people at first, but it just gets darker and darker and they keep peeling away layers of just, not only is what is happening to them dark, but who they actually are is dark. You know, these are not even good. Some of them are really, really bad people. You get the waitress saying, oh, I can tell how in love these two are, but in their fantasies, they're doing horrible things to each other. I think that the guy who dies first is the only semi-decent one, (laughs) not beating his girlfriend, not cheating on his wife or trying to get her to kill herself, not fantasizing about killing her husband. You know, he's the innocent one is the one who dies first. And even the waitress is not that good of a person if she's been having an affair with the trucker that whole time. So we start off thinking all these innocent lives and we just get deeper and deeper. And in the end, you actually feel bad about what happened to people who aren't even that good, you know? (laughs) And it shows you just how demented this character is. Humanity in a way. Yeah. Very well said. Mike, what did you think of it? So as I kind of prefaced in the last one, this this was my least favorite by quite far, actually. Um, And this actually made me stop reading it the first time around. (laughs) That's how much I didn't like it. So I'm like really controversial in this uh, this recording. Like I like horror. I've never read any horror comics, uh, to be honest with you. And I've never read any horror I've read a few books that are horror aligned. Like there's a really cool book I've read, which is like a zombie apocalypse happens and death comes down to sort it out. And that was a really cool idea, but true scary horror. I've not really read much. I read a few short stories here and there and comics. I've read no horror. Uh, I know Immortal Hulk is like a, a story that it comes up quite a lot with you, Steve. And so when I've finished, I'm done with most of my carnage Venom symbiote stuff. Then I'm doing Moon Knight. And then I've got Immortal Hulk lined up as well as all these other things I'm reading. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Thank you, Marvel Unlimited. But with this, so with Tonya explaining that to me, now it makes a lot more sense. The first six pages, I was so lost. I, I couldn't, because up to this point, whenever there's a different character or different perspective, the artwork or the lettering changes so much. I found in this bit, I was like, okay, so who's saying this part? who is what is this part saying is it betty saying it is it the crazy guy um destiny him thinking it and what parts and obviously where it's betty's view on each of these characters i was like okay i i I had to reread that a couple of times I was like, okay i think i generally grasped that and then there's the middle part where it's just bonkers and i was like there's like there's a panel ways watching the um watching tv and you've got the thing that's very similar to come at the frog and i was just like i don't get this 
I don't understand it. I don't know why it's even in there. I'm clearly missing something. So I was just reading it and I was just like, clearly there's something clever here that I'm really missing. And I know that part of it is to show off because when you get to the end, it wraps up and makes more sense. I was like, okay, it's showing once again, mirroring what happened with the episode that I like so much in the house of when the junkie was doing the, the, the um, pouch. Obviously, this is showing the other side, which is like, okay, now with a ruby, now his ruby of power, what happens if that falls into the wrong hands? And what someone who's, you know, should be in Arkham, what he does with it. And so when it gets to the point where they, um, someone cuts off their finger and writes God on him and stuff, I was like, okay, I, I get now what's happening. He's basically controlling them and they don't, they can't figure out what's reality, what's a dream. And whenever they come to, he only uses that against them in like a sycophantic way um, to cause them pain and then as soon as he's kind of bored of that then he puts them back into this crazy world and tortures them in a variety of different ways but now a lot of people here are going to disagree with me but i felt like because this issue and the last issue dragged a bit i felt like what could have happened is the last issue and this one could have just been one issue and although it would have completely ruined the whole 24 hour thing and the whole concept of this comic for me personally it would have ran a lot better because the pacing of this once again it, com- it reminds me a little bit of a live action show we did at something on very recently, which I won't specifically spoil, but people in the know will know where you get to a certain point and you're starting to get interest in the characters and then it completely turns and then goes off talking about other characters. And then you're like, well, so what's happening with Morbius? What's happening with, you know, <coughs> Boba Fett? You know, what's happening with these characters and things? I'm just like, where is that? And so when it got to the bit with the nails being hit into the person's hand, I was like, okay, this is becoming a nightmare thing. And, you know, I guess dreams going to come into the end of it. And by the end, I was more interested. But for me as an individual, just the first half of this comic just took ages to, to draw me in because I think I was just not really understanding what was actually fully going on. It was just a bit too clever for me, if I'm being completely honest with you guys. <laughs> valid points um you're the first person who's ever said they didn't like this issue that i've ever met so that's a first for me so well done on that um because for me i would change nothing about this issue apart from the fact i wish it didn't scare me so much because it's humans the worst monsters of them all but that's just my opinion (laughs) what did you think of it matt well i uh i like horror to an extent but i don't like graphic I'm not, gra- I'm not a graphic, you know, I don't like movies with exploding heads and severed limbs being used as clubs and things like that. That's not the kind of thing that I like about horror. I like the suspense. I like the twist. I like the, the idea of the supernatural and those kinds of things. So for me, this issue, when it gets into a lot of the graphic stuff, I, I wanted to turn the pages faster. I, I, I mean, I read, I read it, but I wanted to turn the pages faster. So we could kind of get to the point because the, 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 the graphic doesn't really do it for me. However, I think we can see in this discussion that uh, there's a lot of different things he's saying about people and who are the monsters. Is Dr. Destiny really any different than the people he's terrorizing? I mean, they're terrorizing each other in certain ways. Um, and what's more monstrous, the, uh, the, the waitress's opinion of the lesbian couple or what she says is monstrous about them you know because you've got you know people looking at things in different ways and you've got uh uh, these people that like you said you know degrade into these terrible people Uh, i think tanya you said that and and it's like uh well who's the monster you know what's what's worse you know what the uh what the waitress is doing and what she's saying about these other people or is it what these other people are doing? And, you know, in some cases, you know, what she's saying is equally bad as the couple that treats the, each other terribly. But in some cases, it's it's not, you know. So it, it just asks a bunch of questions about who the monster is, what is, what's really bad. And then it kind of makes you think, well, you know, there is some sort of pity for uh, and empathy for Dr. Destiny. He's not any different in some ways. He's the same he just is taking it on sort of more people and maybe more traditionally evil than but there's nothing any 
any more or less worse than treating other people the way we see some of these people have treated the people in their lives, you know. And when you find out the, the waitress has been having an affair with a trucker for the whole time, including when this is when his wife finds out that that's what sends her, you know, I don't know what exact happened if, he, if she killed herself or she died or, or she had some kind of disease. I don't remember exactly what happened, the detail, but you realize, well, she's kind of part of that. She kind of is to blame for her death. And it's like, how is that any different? And I think so. I think it's a very complex issue and it's very well done and well written. I just don't respond to the graphic nature of it. So it makes it a difficult issue to get through. Maybe not for the same reasons as it did for Mike, but it's it's still kind of a it's a difficult issue to get through. I certainly would not call it my favorite. My favorite is issue eight. I think I've said that, but I'll say it again. My favorite is issue eight. <laughs> right on saying it, brother. Absolutely. Dave, what did you think of uh, 24 hours? Yeah, I, I'm trying to digest and, and take in. I, I think I need to think more about what everyone said because so many brilliant points. I, I think I saw it in a different way. I, I saw, you know, there are a whole bunch of people um, and very, very flawed human beings, not particularly nice people. I don't think that equates to they deserve to be brutally murdered. <laughs> you know, So I think the I love the way, you know, it is a bit confusing, to be fair, uh, at the start. Is it Betty? I, I think the, the uh, diner lady is a bit confusing about what's happening there but i think once you see uh dr destiny there there's such a menace he's just sat there and it is you know something's coming and then it starts to piece together and you know you have these people and they're having you know dreams or things going on in their own head you know they're not acting out in the real world but they are like say just very unpleasant people a lot of them but i think when he does chop his finger off and you know starts writing on dr destiny's chest and what have you you know it starts to take a turn but i think the the one bit where i've turned the page and the guys got the nails through the hand um you know that i thought i was particularly horrendous um and then it it escalates again when you get the lady um jamming a, a kind of ice pick into her eye and it's just off panel um absolutely brilliantly done and i cannot wait i'm, I'm not a massive fan of horror um, too much of a wuss, quite honestly. If I watch something too scary, I just don't sleep. So I need to cut out the middleman. Don't watch it. But I want to see this on the screen because if they do this well, it will be so fantastic. And again, you, I, I think it will probably need to fill out the story a little bit for the just for the TV with the medium. Um, but no, the, I, I thought the way it was built up was just brilliant. And it, it's almost like not probably a bit more gruesome but almost like a twilight zone episode you know it's it's one of those isn't it and you you get to see that full page in the end where basically everyone's dead and you know there's so much detail um looking around the page no it's, it, it was really good but again another stomach churning issue i think this one very well said all of you each of you's valued uh, makes beautifully valid points whether you like it or not that's the whole thing about art i'm not the kind of person who says, oh you're mad because you didn't like this or you're mad because you did like this the fact you all got something completely different out of it is the magic of what neil gaiman does with his storytelling now what i'd like to put to each and every one of you is and you all made this point tonya you said it first that these are pretty not nice people all around and that's part of the point that I got from it was, it was John D that got his hand on the Dreamstone. And look what he did with it. Would it have been in much better hands with any of the people in that diner? The husband who wanted, to, the wife who wanted to kill the husband, the girlfriend who beat her, her girlfriend, the storyteller who wanted to change these girls' lives because she didn't agree with how they lived it. What? horrors could they have performed if they had that dreamstone this is showing 
D as, as I said, he was a two-dimensional, world-defying villain when he first appeared in 1961 in JLA number five. And now he is something completely other. And that, for me as a comics fan, again, whoever you are, whichever level you come into, you'll get a completely different perspective when you read these comics. So I got that. I got, this isn't the Doctor Destiny I grew up with. This is pure horror. This is honestly darker than some movies I've seen, books I've read. This was pure horror in every fashion. And Matt, I see where you're coming from with the graphic, but like Dave said, the bit with the eyes, you don't actually see it. You don't actually see half of it. You imagine it. And to me, that makes it worse because the pictures we paint in our minds are infinitely darker than the ones the writers and artists are putting on the page. And, and that's what jumped out to me with this chapter. But as I said, each and every one of you, no one's right, no one's wrong, but what you got out of it, that's what counts. And the fact that it made an impression, that's what counts. Any other thoughts on 24 hours before we move on to Sound and Fury? Tonya. I wanna to speak to something that Mike said and about why he didn't like this issue. Something that's come up a few times on season's greetings with Tony and Jack, when they have two episodes of a show together that you don't like, it's the second one that you end up disliking more. I think the issue is the previous issue. Like, I think this one works, but because there wasn't enough dream in the previous issue and we weren't staying, it didn't feel like we were staying on story and the pacing was slow for that. Then we move to this and you're already out of patience for not having dream where this, I'm not saying that I loved this issue, but it worked as an issue with the beginning and end that it had, because ultimately I think it's saying what Guillermo del Toro has been showing us for years. And that's that humans are the monsters. The monsters aren't the monsters, the people are the monsters. And I think they showed that and they had to make it, they had to give us a villain going up against Dream that we would have some concerns you know, who would give us some concerns about this guy isn't going to have any compassion for him and he's, you're not going to be able to reason with him. And we're not going to get the same thing like in A Hope in Hell. We're not going to get the same kind of end to that story. It's going to have to be something else. Very well put. What did you think, Matt? Um, from what you just said, Tanya, this is what something that I just thought of is these are originally single issues that came out the span of a month so how much different is it in our experience to sit down and read them in a collection one to the next as opposed to having that month to uh ruminate and have that story you know sit with us and then come in to a new issue and uh and i think what you said about issue or episodes back to back um made me think about that and just that something we, we take for granted the way comics are written today with uh, storylines being uh, decompressed into six issues of, for a trade, you know, this is not six issues. This is seven or maybe eight issues. And really there's a story going on in the, in, in the grand scheme, but there's also smaller little stories. It's just, it's, I think, I guess Dave, you talked about how it's, you know, functions more like a, a modern storytelling, but at the same time, you can pick up any one of these issues and go, there's a full story here in each issue, which is something we don't always get in comics today. We get, uh, you know, little bits of chapters that feel like connective tissue, where if you sat down and you, I know I've reviewed tons of comics where I go, this will read better as a trade, because you'll sit down and read all six issues, and you'll get it, you know, and I feel like uh, it may have been perceived differently by us if we had read it back in the day when it first came out. Can you talk on that at all, Steve? Do you recall anything remotely like that? Or is it so ingrained it's hard to... You're absolutely spot on. Let's remember, this is 35 years ago. And even back then, comics came out monthly. They had no real inklings of how this would do. Sales weren't great, even though word of mouth was phenomenal for this series in the first year or so. So this was a comic you'd read monthly. And... The gap between months, reading this physically as a monthly comic was almost torture because you did not know where the next issue was going to take you. So reading it like this now, and it does change as the books progress, you will realise that 
some of them do read much better as books than this one did because they never ever envisioned this being collected and people like us talking about it three and a half decades later so it was a completely different kettle of fish and you're quite right and that's why you're all right as well because this how we've read it now isn't how it was originally presented or made to be read and that is a very valid point to take in which is why yeah i will never disagree with anything any one of you say because it's all very valid i mean mike obviously you, you've had thoughts of it now since we've spoken about it yeah yeah so there's two points i want to make as well which is one is to dave's point which is he says he's interested to see how this issue is going to work in um in the video medium on the, the netflix show and i think it's going to work any issue that i have with it i think it's going to work incredibly well um i'm actually quite excited to see this episode specifically because I, I love horror I, I love um many many horror films and things and i'm fine with gore or any of those sort of things but generally yeah i'm more of a psychological thriller more so um and i think with this i i understand its purpose and things but i think that probably more so just the first few pages for me it was almost like everything i've been complimenting the lettering or something i feel like if there was one minor thing just a tweak to maybe anything that betty was saying was maybe a notepad because they they did write there's a part i think in one of the later issues where someone writes something down actually i think it might be in this one actually that's yes, when the the girl says about her partner and she writes sorry donna or, or whatever i feel like maybe if that part was when it was betty thinking things then i would have got to grips with it earlier and i'd been more on board but i think also with what tonya said of because the last issue for me was oh it's all about this dr destiny guy who i don't really care about and then it's like oh it's, it's more of him it's like okay fatigue in some way but linking on with how you have just said about you know reading things uh, differently now is that the driving force of me pushing through this and reading this is because miracle man I heard the hype of that solely from primarily sort of you, Steve, and then the extended comics emotion family. And then with Miracle Man discussions, Swamp Thing and Sandman always come up as well. So I know about the quality of those. And I know with Miracle Man, I read book one and I was like, yeah, this is pretty good. And I read book two and I was like, this is actually really cool. And then I read book three and I was like, this is one of the greatest things I've ever read in my entire life. How have I gone this long without consuming it? And I've read book three by itself a couple of times. I'm like, I could just read pages of this over and over again, almost every day and find new stuff. So it's kind of my experience is like, even if this issue isn't grabbing me or the last one didn't because of the slow burn of Miracle Man and how I view Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman, obviously they're very similar in a lot of ways. And they, you know, with Miracle Man, especially, you know, Neil Gaiman continues on the legacy. I hold them in both in very high esteem. So I'm like, the patience for me is okay. Oh, they misstepped a little bit. I know the quality it's going for. I trust everyone else's sort of thoughts on this. It's held in the same regard as Miracle Man. So I'm going to persevere as opposed to if it was coming out monthly and I was back 35 years ago, I don't know how I would have reacted without that prior knowledge and hype behind it if you know what i mean very very valid point i would uh, just add a couple more of the uh, breadcrumb moments uh, particularly for people like mike dave and tonya who've already mentioned them so obviously we've had ethel cripps leading to d um with the mention of brute and glob they're going to have a big big uh, part in further chapters in this one obviously nada don't forget nada very important in this one, Judy, the lady who stabs herself in the eyes, speaks to her girlfriend, Donna, on the phone. And she also talks to a lady called Rose. Remember, Rose, very important, because she links back to a certain Unity Kincaid, the lady who slept and had a baby while she slept. Follow these breadcrumbs and do read this book again before we come back to book two, if we're hopefully lucky enough to do so because this is preemptive storytelling at its absolute finest this is universe building hey guys sorry i can't be there to talk about sandman with you i really wish i could be there but thank you very much for the invite to have a chat with you and let you know what i thought of it firstly there's not really much i can say about sandman that hasn't already been said by people um far wiser and far more intelligent than me uh what i can tell you is uh my basic feelings on it i suppose I first read Sandman when it came out, month to month. Uh, it was a, for someone who is a mainstream comic reader like me, I'm a, very much a Superman, Spider-Man, Justice League, Batman kind of guy. Uh, this was really something that I wasn't used to. It's uh, become one of my favorite comics of all time. 
However, I do have to admit, uh, the first time reading it, there were things that I didn't understand. Uh, I think that there is, it is a book that definitely requires a rereading quite a few times to kind of catch up with everything. It's also one of those books where a lot of things is, are foreshadowed early on that you may not realise what it is you're reading. Uh, the comparison I would make would be James Robinson's Starman in that regard. Uh, I think that these two, for me, are kind of distant cousins. My uh, main takeaway from reading Starman this time was I'm not sure how the binge versus the weekly model of it works. Uh, I think one of the, the joys of Sandman and one of the reasons I was able to digest it the way that I did, being a mainstream comic guy, was because it was coming out monthly, I could read each issue, I could kind of revisit it before the next issue came out, and that's how I made sense of a lot of the mythology. And it is a very, very wordy book, so sometimes you do need to go back and reread. With everything now being written for graphic novels, I suppose this is one of the points where Old Man Conroy will come out and rear his ugly head, is I don't think the Sandman is something that lends itself to being binge read. I think the Sandman is a book that needs to be read slowly. It does need breaks. You do need to be able to digest it. You do need to be able to think about it. And when you're racing through it in graphic novel format, I think it's detrimental to the actual material. I think that Gaiman's work in general, not just Sandman, but in general, works best when um, given time to reflect and digest because he is big on mythology and he is big on the world building. Um, Sandman being the key example of that with all of his works. That being said, um, I understand why it's still as popular as it was. I understand why it's still considered a classic. I think just some, a little something may be taken away from it in the way that it's read now as uh, a binge versus a weekly watch. But I still think that it is quite easily one of the greatest comics that's ever been made. I think one of the things that may surprise people with this book if they haven't read it and they're looking at it and thinking it might be a little bit heavy is the Sandman surprisingly has a lot of humour within it. It has characters who have a very dry wit. It has characters who are practical jokers. It has characters who are sleazy. It has characters who are witty. Uh, and I think that one of the things that gets lost when people talk about Sandman for me is the humour that is actually in the book. There are light-hearted aspects. There are extremely heavy aspects as well. But I don't think people should shy away from this book thinking that it is an intimidating book to read. Because one of the things that Gaiman does is he does make it accessible by making some of the characters humorous. He makes them light-hearted and as I said some of the characters do have a wit to them. That's one of the things which surprised me when I first read it and it is still one of the things that takes me off guard when I go back and reread it now. So I think that anyone who not just enjoys comic books but anyone who enjoys literature in any way, anyone who enjoys mythology in any way, I would be hard pressed not to recommend this to anyone. Simply it's one of the greatest stories told in the comic book medium. The fact that it goes for so long as well may be intimidating to people, don't let that put you off. It's something which will hold your interest, it will engage you and we do get characters that we meet very, very early who evolve and change and that is just part of the fun of reading this book. So what I would say is if you are looking at reading Sandman, there's two things I would definitely recommend. Firstly, please take your time with it. Don't rush it. Don't feel the need to go through it and plough through this book. This book is not a bubblegum book. This book is not something that deserves to be binged and one and done in a night. I know that's the way some people read, but having the experience, having read it myself and enjoyed it myself, and read it both ways, weekly and as a binge, 
I would highly recommend taking your time with it. Don't rush it. The second thing is be open to the book. Allow yourself to know that you're not going to understand everything. So be open to it. Be open to the fact that this book wants you to be confused at times. This book wants you to wonder what's going on. This book has mysteries to it. This book is one of the best for a simple reason. It keeps you coming back. If you pay this book the respect that it deserves, if you give this book your full attention, your full focus and your full time, there's not many other books apart from the aforementioned Starman which will give you a beginning to an end that is more satisfying. So again, guys, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be there to chat with you at the book club. Hopefully I'll make it to the next one. But now we'll move on to Sound and Fury. So we've seen the threat of D, how it grows, his power, and how, how Tonya quite beautifully put, this guy is a threat to Morpheus who faced down the hordes of hell. So this final battle, it's very comic book yet totally not. What did you make of it, Tonya? I found it anticlimactic. I wanted Dream to be victorious, not kind of win because something bad kind of happened that he didn't foresee happening. This was not a three steps ahead chess move. This was, all right, I'm giving it a shot. I'm rolling the dice on it. And hey, it worked out. And that didn't work for me. I, I wanted him to achieve the win, not receive it. You know what I mean? I wanted him to be an active agent in his win. And he wasn't. I wanted to see him. And I also wanted to see him get vengeance. Like, I was not okay with this. Well, it wasn't your fault. It's because I wasn't with the stone. And so I won't hold you accountable for all of these horrible things that you did, including stealing from me. I wanted vindication and I did not get that. Valid. Very different. I like it. Um, yeah, I, I actually really liked it. Um, I, you know, the artwork in itself, I think it speaks volumes in this, uh, this issue. This issue has one of the strongest levels of artwork of just use of block colors, you know, early on when it's a lot of black and things, but the speech bubbles kind of come out of the edges, which I really like. And then obviously there's that, you know, sorry if I'm stealing anyone's thunder who's going to talk about this, but, you know, towards the end when uh, our three breaks the stone and there's just that this whole comic it and it's just the little tiny seam there. And I actually really like to counter what Tonya felt. Um, I actually felt the opposite. I really liked this element because the way I read it was the dream where he's kind of, and I feel like this gets added to in the next issue as when he speaks with death is that when he got lost and taken for those 70 odd years, he kind of, he not only depowered physically without his tools, but mentally he was just like, for me, I interpret it as the first time he's ever really had a break but not in a good way, but in a bad way, kind of like, um, you know, losing uh, how how good one is with something, you know, oh, I haven't played guitar in, you know, 20 years. I don't know if I'll be able to pick it up. So you're a little bit rusty. And the way I interpret that is him kind of thinking that he is immortal and endless and not really taking enough stride of thinking the consequences of these things that could happen. And this was kind of like a lesson learned where this was like, oh man, and he even says it, doesn't he? He's like, like he destroyed it. I didn't even think of doing that. Like that, that actually benefited me. That would have been a smart thing to do. I didn't, you know, I messed up here. And I, I think that was like a teaching lesson for him. And then it kind of with his somewhat, him kind of being in the next issue, not to jump ahead, but him kind of being a downer as kind of death puts it, you know, he's kind of being a bit of a sulker. I think this kind of feeds into that where he's kind of self-punishing. He's like, I should have really been able to best this guy. And when you kind of thought about it, you're like, yeah, I, I didn't really get out of this as I should have done. I'm an endless. This is just in essence, basically just a human who's crazy and probably quite clever. And I really liked that the kind of the way he won wasn't to be expected. And it, for me was a teachable moment for him not to mention all the colors and the paneling and everything in this has been really cool so i actually really enjoyed this one tonya even though i was i was the negative nelly of the last episode so i i have to hold my hands up there and be like yeah i loved i didn't like the one everyone else loved but i really enjoyed this one that tonya didn't so i can point the finger back at her <laughs>
And once again, you're both right. None of none of you is wrong. So brilliant. Hundred um, percent. Really, really valid opposing points and a brilliant discussion. I absolutely love it, Matt. I'm sure you'd have something even more to add. Yeah. Um. I guess since uh, this is not supposed to be your standard superhero comic, I was glad it didn't devolve into a standard superhero battle with, you know, Batman smacking down Joe Chill in the alley or something. Uh, to use an analogy. I, I felt like that aspect worked. I also think that there's something uh, more subtle going on. If uh, what's in the Dreamstone is part of Morpheus, it really can't be used to, to kill him because it's him. How can that spiritual aspect of you be used to against you? I think there's something subtle to be said there um, that, that I took from that, from, that as from that bit of it. So I don't have a lot to say, just that I, I was glad it wasn't like a regular superhero battle. And I think there's something a little deeper going on with the aspect of one's power and one's soul and how you can use that again, how that power, because we're talking about sort of a life force and energy, that kind of thing. That's that you can't use your own life force in that sense to, to really kill yourself. I don't think that doesn't really, that's sort of incongruous. I mean, you can commit suicide by using your own arm to slit your throat, but you can't, but you're, your soul, your your energy. I'm not an energy person, but I'll say energy can't be used negatively against yourself. I don't think so. To me, it, it worked in that sense, more of a, a a spiritual metaphysical sense, I guess. Yeah, nicely put. What did you think, Dave? <sighs> Probably more with Tonya on this episode. Ep I keep calling it episode issue. Um, I thought it was a little bit more like a traditional superhero, supervillain smackdown, you know, in terms of the, the way it all came together. Um, but what I would say is up until this point, I was kind of reading uh, Dr. Destiny's, you know, words. The voice in my head was more like a golem type voice. But then there is this oh, one of my favorite little bits uh, where he's the most British guy. He says, come to me, you spineless, spittle ass, poxy pale wanker. <laughs> I love like, that line so, so much. It's so good. And I was like, oh, it must be English, I guess. Um, so I did really enjoy that. I, and I think I, I'm probably more forgiving that it's kind of like, oh, you've destroyed the Dreamstone, didn't think of doing that and, and just happens to you know save the day I, I think there's so many movies you know over the years that where the hero I mean you look at the James Bond movies most of the time he's just lucky <laughs> you know, he's just got that plot armor and he just happens to um, uh, bumble his way through it um, so yeah I, I, th I thought it was just a middling issue for me I thought it was it, it was predictable that you know, Dream would come out on top and, you know, it, it's almost, there was nothing particularly clever, I don't think, about it. It was just, for me, it was a little bit by the numbers and Dream wins out. Um, you know, we get our, it's almost like a serial kind of story, isn't it? It's like, oh, we'll, we'll be back next week uh, and we'll put our villain in prison uh, to come back another day. So, yeah, I think I... I was thinking there'd be a little bit of vengeance as well. I mean, this is not a redeemable character, is he? I mean, he's he's fairly despicable. Um, what we saw with him killing that woman and then what he did in torturing the people in the diner. So, yeah. But this this felt like the full stop to me. This felt like this is where it finishes. Um, so I think, although Matt, would probably disagree because it's the next one's his favorite uh issue so yeah just about the middle for me cool and again all very very valid um what i will say is that i'm really glad all of you said that you didn't expect dream tack this way towards d because we will learn in further volumes that this whole experience of being captured and incarcerated by humans of losing his power, coming close to death, and then visiting the human world again has had a profound effect on Morpheus. Dream himself, as you'll learn in later issues, prior to his capture, was a bit of an arsehole. 
self-centered, selfish, self-important. And the tale of Nada is a prime example of that because he's grown and he's learned from that. Uh, he's going to learn and grow more, particularly when his big sister, who we'll meet in the next chapter, basically gives him a kick up the moral backside to make him rectify the wrongs of his life. And for me, the whole battle with D is, yes, you know he's going to win because this comic's called Sandman. It's not called The Adventures of Dr. Destiny. But the way he won, the way it wasn't a beatdown, the way he wasn't, oh, yes, take that evil doer, scumbag. The fact that he won almost by accident, I found a breath of fresh air. Remember, I read this 35 years ago when every villain got their ass handed to him on a weekly basis. So this was something brand new and left field back then. And the fact that, like Mike so brilliantly put it, when it all ends and he destroys the Dreamstone because he thinks he's going to win by doing so and kill Dream, or if he's that little Dr. D in that huge white expanse, which the next few pages to me is what did it, that great huge white expanse which turns out to be Morpheus's hand. And he's holding D like the bug that he really is because this is Dream of the Endless. We don't know it at this point. But that's the first time you get an inkling of what this being really is. And the next issue, I'll agree with Matt, it's my favourite issue in this book. It's actually one of my favourite comic books of all time because it actually changed the way I look at death, but we'll come into that when we talk about it. This is that first inkling of what the endless are, before gods, after gods, timeless, endless. The meeting with Marsh and Manhunter did that too, but the next episode is where we come out of this world building first book and we become and join with the worlds of the Sandman later. So any last thoughts about Sound and Fury before we move on to the Sound of Her Wings? Dave and or Tonya, no, let's go ladies Tonya first. Tonya first. Spoke, yeah. Yeah. I just want to clarify, I'm not saying I wanted a big physical beatdown. I just wanted, I wanted him to be an agent of his own victory. So, I didn't want it to I be an that. accident. And you can do it psychologically like he did in A Hope in Hell. There, there was no physical beat down there, but he was able to claim victory with the brilliance of his own mind. I would prefer that he had tricked him into breaking the stone, even if he wasn't sure it was going to work. I just wanted him to have some agency here, not, well, we'll go to my world and see what happens. And that was it. It just didn't feel like his personality anymore. And they never brought back the whole Nada thing, which is, this is someone you love and you're okay with them being punished for all eternity, but this guy did all this and you're just like, I don't care. Even if he said, you don't matter to me, thus I don't need you to be punished. That would have worked for me. Like you, you are so insignificant that I'm not even going to bother punishing you. I would have accepted that, but instead he was kind to him. He didn't deserve kindness. Completely agree. Yeah, very, very points. But um, yeah, it's age and perspective. And I think that things have progressed in comic books since then. So yeah, really valid point. Absolutely can't argue with any of it. Dave. I was just going to add, as much as I didn't love the ending, it was still so much better than Wonder Woman 1984 <laughs> with the Dreamstone. So, you know, I, I'll praise it for that. <laughs> Take that. I don't think anyone is arguing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely take that. Right. So let's close Preludes and Nocturnes. We've met Dream of the Endless, um, Neil Gaiman's creation. Now let's meet the second of his creations, but he didn't create all of them, but we'll talk about that in later volumes. And let's meet his big sister, the one who's behind all this mess in the first place, the one they wanted to capture, Lady Death. Tonya, I know you must have thoughts on this lady. <laughs> so I was already familiar with Death. I did not understand that there was a connection to this material. So we get here and I was like, ooh, she's in this. And then I'm realizing, wait, didn't they say that they were a family? Does that mean that they're siblings? You know, so it was kind of cool, but it, it definitely felt like an epilogue to a story that already finished. So it was an add-on bonus kind of thing. I think I mentioned earlier, it, it felt like something that connected the two stories together, something transitional where 
this will help you get from this story to the next story. And it's kind of like a teaser for what is to come. But I found it very moving. It was touching. And even though I, I understood what was happening, I don't think that there were any tricks happening. Like even when she referenced the guy's name, it's like, oh, he's going to die today. But they did it. They did it well. They did it beautifully. It was predictable, but it was, they handled it well. I really liked the way that it looked and it was moving. I found it very moving. Yeah, I, I loved this episode. Um, I, I'm in agreement that it doesn't feel like it is explicitly part of this uh, volume, uh, which is ironic because the first book club we did, I think we said the same thing with the Darth Vader stuff. The one at the end was uh, kind of like an add on, but I suppose it's kind of depends on how one wants to interpret it. It's like, you know, is this, is it kind of like a post credit scene where its only purpose is to hook you to get you to consume the next piece of content? Or is it, you know, him kind of reflecting on this experience and how, as you've kind of said, uh, Steve, this is like this experience of the prelude is the anchor point which causes the events of the next subsequent volumes. So this is kind of the moment of reflection. But this is kind of the, um, you know, you normally get it in most films. Oh, the big bad has been defeated. You've you've killed them and stuff. And then the film doesn't normally end then. You normally have about five minutes of, you know, superheroes metaphorically cleaning up the dust around them, brushing themselves off and figuring out, hey, that was a hard one, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, punching the arm, you know, classic. That's almost what it is to me. And what I quite enjoy about this is it shows um, a very small insight into the wider world more of the endless so this was like a show of the power that dream has in a lot of ways what can happen when his powers go into the wrong hands what who wants them you know be demons in hell all the way up to humans and things what kind of the the two goalposts are of his power that's all you kind of know you don't really know the in between you just kind of have an idea of oh if it goes wrong these are the extents of what he can do and then when you bring death into it and their kind of family dynamic and things it's like they are endless beings, but they are still not necessarily human, but it is kind of like that, where they still, they are a a being rather than just being this kind of force, in a sense. You know, one thinks of death as a inescapable force. It's just something that comes with life. Whereas the personification of death is, whenever you get this in countless pieces of media, I'm always very intrigued by people's, you know, interpretation to death the very sim- sa- standard one is the grim reaper you know and it's just kind of a lot of the time it doesn't talk or anything it just comes through and it goes but then you've got marvel's death as well which is very interesting and i think it has quite a few similarities to the dc's death as well i don't know who did what first or whatever i know very limited things about the both elements of death i just know deadpool dated death i think <laughs> which is uh which is quite an interesting idea but with this it's i i feel like this has made me want to read more i think that's almost the point of this one is it's kind of trying to go that was dream story now do you want to know about the rest of the endless do you know what 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 is dream going to do after this is he you know this could have almost been if it ended slightly differently or even if it didn't end differently this could have just been the oh well if we don't get any more issues this is quite a nice place to end it because it's open-ended enough where you're kind of being like hey we can do other stuff with this we've got plans this is just the uh the um foundations for what's to come or if it doesn't land this is just a cool mini series about the adventures of dream in a sense so i think that looking at it in both of those ways i feel like when i after this book club i'm going to be reading um volume two i'm going to reread this and see if it feels like it kind of should end with this or that because i feel like it is going to be that kind of the stepping stone in a sense but i really liked it and mainly because as i said i'm a law junkie so this was like oh here's death so any when i inevitably go on future book clubs about the rest of these ones every time there's a comic that's going to have a huge amount of law or an interpretation of a religious figure or another endless is introduced i'm probably going to really like it because that's that's my jam with these ones uh, but yeah I, I thought it was excellent got so much to look forward to mike so much every law imaginable every god imaginable, every pantheon imaginable as one. That's the power of Neil Gaiman, but we'll come to that, hopefully one day. Matthew. Yes. uh, I've already said numerous times that this is my favorite issue out of the eight collected. And uh, just a couple random thoughts first. Um, This is a great example of a comic 
back in the day where you got a one shot issue that was not specifically supposed to be the last chapter of a story, the first chapter of a story. You just got a standalone issue, which happens very rarely anymore. So it's really a, you know, something that you don't see. So I can understand why it might be uh, difficult for some of you that aren't used to reading comics like that and you're used to storylines that are set in uh, in volumes that it feels disjointed. And it, it feels disjointed to me uh, too, but really in a different way. I feel like it suddenly is sort of tonally different and uh, it feels like there's just a lot more heart and emotion and feeling in these pages than there is in the entirety of the early, the first seven issues. Um, and quite honestly, this is not the first time I've read this, but I haven't read beyond this. Um, I, I feel like if I was a reader in uh, 1988, 89, I can't remember the exact year. 86. 86, is that old? 86, 87, wow. yeah. I, yeah, I don't know that the individual first seven issues would have been enough to hook me. But if you had given me issue number eight, I'd have said, oh, my God, I want to read more of this because of that relationship with the characters, the emotion, um, the way he addresses uh, uh, the idea of death. And, and not that it's death personified as a person, not that it's death personified as an attractive young girl, which would have appealed to a teenage boy, um, which we see he uses that in the story itself. Um, but but rather the the the, the relationships between uh uh, dream and death and then death and her her I don't want to call them victims because that's not right her her friends she's visiting for the last time um it, it's that it's that sensitivity it's that tenderness that care I mean I, I mean there's one I can't even say it without feeling the, the lump in my throat I think when she picks up the baby you know it uh you know I got that lump in my throat and comics don't usually make me feel like crying but but this this really brought that kind of emotion to the service and that to me is sells to me on the series whereas the first you said this is the the worst salmon volume and i i sure hope so because <laughs> because I, overall the last issue does it for me the other seven feel in some ways sort of it's good. It's good. It's okay. It's good. I'm not getting all the what's coming next yet, but I know that there's more to come. So I know there's going to be stuff in there that'll pay off. But as a uh, introduction to a, a, a series, reading that eight is issue, I'd have read that. I'd have said, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to get. I'm going to get number nine. I don't care what it is, connected or not. I'm going to buy that. But I don't know if I would have made it to eight with uh, with it originally back in 1986. That's my own personal uh, uh, feelings on it. Uh, and then it also made me think of other interpretations of death in fiction, like uh, anyone ever read Piers Anthony's uh, Incarnations of Immortality series? Uh, the first book is called On a Pale Horse, and it's about, uh, it's about death, exactly like this, where there's a person, an entity that is in charge of death just like she is and but the story is about how the old the old entity is being passed the powers being passed on to a new entity which is just a person like anyone else and they have to and it goes through uh, death and time and fate and satan and all kinds of different things uh so it feels very connected um and so i was just thinking about how it's the same thing like how does you know in, in that story the, the character has to figure out how to get people just the right moment so that it's not too soon and not too late. So they experience all the pain of the car running them over. It's getting them at the right moment and being that sort of gentle touch and uh, almost like doing them a favor and helping out as opposed to, you know, it's death, you're dead, Urgh, you know, which is so often the, the traditional thought of death. And then I also thought about um, the, a Twilight Zone episode that you may or may not have seen. I don't remember the title. I didn't Google the title, but it's the one with Robert, Red, a young Robert Redford, where he is also death. And it's the same type of story where he has to, there's an old woman that uh, is afraid of dying. She hasn't gone out of the house in years. She lives like in a basement apartment somewhere. So there's steps down to her door. She can see the step footsteps out the window. If anybody comes down to her, she has her groceries delivered and left on the soup. She doesn't get them until somebody, the person goes away. But then there's a, a incident with a, 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 
a policeman and uh, you know a, a bank robber or something and the policeman gets shot rolls down the stairs and he's please help me help me she lets him in she doesn't want to because she's afraid of death right and it's robert redford but what she doesn't know the entire episode is that he's actually a death and that it just sort of goes on the whole inescapable aspect of it that it's not something terrible it's not something ugly it's an attractive robert redford um a young attractive robert redford it's uh it's something that's uh you can't you can't escape like that and it's not really something to be afraid of. It just is. It's part of life. And I feel like a game and play on the exact same themes. And I'm almost willing to, I'd be willing to bet he's seen that episode and was inspired by it because it really felt very similar in that way. And uh, that also goes back to uh, something we were talking about earlier. I think Tanya talking about how uh, Martian Manhunter sees dream in one way. Uh, and then uh, novice sees him in another way. Uh, and then I think death should operate the same way is that just like that old woman in the Twilight Zone story is going to see Robert, a young, attractive man, you know, the boy in the story is going to see a young, attractive girl, et cetera. And even I though, want to know exactly how she looks to Martian Manhunter. That is something that has been, you know, churning with me. It's like, I, I need to see more of this. I need to see how she looks to the other universes. Yeah. I, I don't, Steve, you can tell us if that ever happens or not, but I, I was thinking about that as I was reading it, just going, she can't look like uh, 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 an earthly goth girl to Martian Manhunter. She's got to look like, you know, maybe his wife. I don't know, since his wife has already passed, maybe he would see her as his, you know, his wife from Mars and, or one of his kids just saying, you know, daddy, you're home, you're welcoming. Now I'm going to get sick. Oh, I'm going to get choked up. So I don't know if there's anything more to say, but that's, that's why I love that one so much and why, to me, it's totally completely different. Uh, if you may, it feels like the series finds itself with that issue, whereas the first seven issues is, this is good, nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't feel like it has that really great quality yet. But then I get all of that and that thrown into that last issue. So that's my thoughts on that. It's lovely. What about you, Dave? Yeah, I think, Matt, you've just changed my perspective on the issue that actually it is, it's a one shot, isn't it? I, I've been trying to think, why is this? tagged on at the end there i don't quite get it but it is definitely a one shot and it, and it works as that standalone issue um yeah i i love this uh issue i think i think you said it before steve that it just sort of changes your perspective on death and it is it's comforting and it it leaves an impression on you so when when you put the book down you go away and you're thinking about it and you're thinking about oh, my own sort of perspective on what I think death is. And, you know, I think if a, you know, attractive goth girl, you know, is there to comfort you at the end, oh, happy days, kill me now. <laughs> you know? So no, I, I really liked it. And it made me wonder, well, was she there when John Constantine's ex passed away i'm guessing she must have been but you know that happened off panel but no I, I thought it was really good and you know they they lay it up don't they with the girl who's playing football and what have you and then uh, again i didn't see it coming but obviously she passes away later definitely agree with matt it was a, a choking moment when she's there for the baby and you know before it happens it's like oh no and then it does happen and you see the mother are oh, horrendous. Um, but yeah, just, I, I thought again, it, it was a really, really strong issue, this one. And um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't up until right now to, we've just been discussing it that I was thinking, where does it fit? I, I don't get it. But yeah, no, that makes perfect sense to me. I love what each and every one of you has said. Absolutely brilliant. Um, it's one of my favourite single comic books of all time. But again, it's what you get out of it and where you were at the time. Um, back when this first came out, I was about 17. And um, I, I don't want to talk about it too much because it, it hurts. Um, but I was going through a pretty shitty patch in my life uh, at home. Um, I'd gone through a horrible breakup. A dear friend of mine was suffering from an incurable disease at our age. 
and um i was yes i was in a dark place and this comic i mean it's cheesy and as dumb and as corny as it sound sounds um help bring me out of that i gave this issue to the friend who was dying and um they told me to help them and i realized that this is a comic but this is 20 pages of fiction but it taught me a really valuable lesson that death never killed anybody cancer kills people falling out of an airplane kills people getting hit by a bus kills people people um death is there to take you away from that and lead you somewhere better and we find out in later issues that she's the one who brings you here in the first place every human being on earth has two conversations with death one before they're born and one when they leave this place and i just found that hugely comforting to the point where i'm afraid of how i might meet my death but death itself not anymore and this comic book did that now obviously the the character of death herself i love her in every way her personality her vibe her attitude uh, her love of apples which we'll learn about later her for humanity and for life that what we learn in later issues and is that each aspect each endless is their name and the opposite of such so dream really is as much about reality as, as he is about dreams and death is the embodiment of life as much as she is the embodiment of death and little lines like um with the baby which always gets to me Oh, is that it? Is that all I get? Hey, you get what everyone gets, a lifetime. It's just writing. It's just art. It's just literature. And this is a 20-page comic. And that's why this issue to me is just pure magic. And the fact that it's the last chapter in book one and in several early printings of book two, it's the first chapter in book two as well, is hugely important. And let's think, what would have happened if Roderick Burgess had captured who he meant to capture? Look what happened to the world when he took away Dream. Well, we will kind of find out, but that's all I'm saying. But for now, that was it. Um, if you want to know more about death and the inspiration behind her, Look up a model called Cinnamon Hadley, who is who Mike Gingerberg used for his inspiration. She passed recently, and you will look at her and think, well, damn, that's that's death. But think about the massiveness, the scope, the power, the dark magic and horror of issues one to seven. And like Matt said, think about the tiny, beautiful story between a brother and sister that we get in book eight. They're worlds apart, but they're telling one story. And that is something that happens later on as you learn more about her and more about the other five siblings, because there are seven in this after all. And that is where it all comes from. This is where it all begins. The first six issues, first seven issues were world building. And now this is the universe unfolding before us. And if you liked what you've read in this one, I promise you, you are going to love what comes next dave you said where was death when constantine and uh dream were with rachel i think she looked like constantine i think for her that would have been what she needed to see to welcome her oh so she was yeah because she was with constantine wasn't she huh. I'm going to have to go back and read that again now. <laughs> you said something about death being with you when you're born, too, which means that she really is life. She's not just death. She's life. She's the life cycle, which explains the onk. It's no longer a sarcastic thing. It's no, this this represents her function. So I thank you for mentioning that, because I think that's kind of cool. Very welcome. 
has, has someone got a positive point? Because I don't want to leave it on a downer. But I really don't like this last panel. It reminds me, do you remember Police Squad? Where at the end, they just freeze. And they... <laughs> Well, pretend to freeze, they, like she's still saying. And, they pretend, and then yeah. they're like, <laughs> it's just the way he's throwing the seed there and he's got a big smile on his face. I don't know. It just, it feels like a 70s. I found it completely life affirming because the sound yeah. of the wing signals death and her taking a human being from beyond the veil, but he's there feeding pigeons in the park and he sprinkles the bird feed and the birds fly around him off to fly off and live their lives. That's the way I interpreted that. That, like Tonya said, she is death, but she is life. She is everything that makes this life great. To the point where, little spoiler, but it's not going to really spoil the story, is death loves this life so much that once every 100 years, she takes on human form and lives as a human being for 24 hours. Just as she knows what it feels like to be one of us and that sweetness of life before you go. So that's a little aspect of the character I do think you need to know about. And also the fact that she is about as alive as you could possibly get. And you'll see that later on. And if you think the telling off she gives Morpheus in this chapter is hilarious, boy. Big sisters, they don't mess around. Um, I do believe that's the end of another book club. Um, I hope you will all enjoy the book. I mean, are you at least interested to read more? Definitely. Good stuff. Because we have to learn about Nada. We have to learn about um, Rose. We have to learn about so many other things. We have to go to a convention. And this isn't no Comic-Con. We have to learn about Shakespeare and the power of dreams. We have to learn about fairies and gods and immortals and the rest of the endless. But that's all still in volumes to come. But until we get there, hey, let's tell everyone in the Comics in Motion multiverse where they can see us, hear us and learn more about us. Tonya, where on the World Wide Web can our listeners and viewers find you? You can find me at my website, www.mistonyatodd.com, and I'm available across social media at Ms. Tanya Todd. I'll pass the, the mic to Mike. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> well then, um, you can find me on social media at Genuine Chits Chat uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. I have two main shows out. I've got Genuine Chit Chat, where I have honest conversations with interesting people. I have had each of these lovely people on the show at least once, and I've got plenty of fun guests uh, for the year to come. Some authors, comic book artists, lots of other cool individuals, and etc. And my other show is Star Wars Comics in Canon. New episodes come out every Saturday uh, on the feed of Comics in Motion. And if you want to keep up to date with both Genuine Chit Chat and also Star Wars Comics in Canon, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel as well by searching for genuine chit chat where all of the episodes for all of those things are in playlists are all put together very nicely uh, for your perusal uh, so yeah just follow me on social media or at youtube and you can find out all the stuff you need to about myself and my various shows yes. mr lloyd um i'm a reviewer and editor at dc comics news you can read comic reviews there uh from me weekly i also have a show on the comics and motion network called classic comics with Matthew B. Lloyd, oddly enough. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Matt B. Underscore Lloyd, or you can follow the comics, uh, the classic comic show at Comics Lloyd on Twitter. Uh, you can also find me on Amazon, uh, Batman, uh, uh, Politics in Gotham, the Batman Universe and Political Thought. I've got a chapter in that book. And uh, what uh, there's a new Black Panther book that just came out, uh, and it's called What Wakanda Can Offer the World. I have a chapter in that with a friend as well, and we're also working on another Batman chapter with a looming deadline. And Dave, well, Comics in Motion, you and Chris, what have you done? Oh, well, uh, you. <laughs> not so much with the TV and movies, but that's generally where you can get me on Comics in Motion. I'm working on another little project with Tony and Max that hopefully we should be... Uh, uh, putting together in the next month 
So quite excited about that one as well. You can also get me, let me think, uh, the VHS Strikes Back if you like the older movies, um, Back to the Office if you like the classic UK Office as well, and probably a load of others I've, I've forgot. So. <laughs> So thanks for hosting, Steve. It, it's Pleasure. been a long one tonight, but I, I actually, I really do want to follow up with these, uh, with these Sandman collected editions because I feel like I got a lot from the reading experience, but actually I got a lot from just everyone's perspectives and just thoughts about it. So I, I don't actually want to just read the book and not come back and discuss it I, I really enjoyed the whole experience of kind of going through it in this way that's the whole point what of a brilliant way to book another appearance <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> shameless <laughs> dave's all right i'll talk to dave <laughs> yeah <laughs> are, are, are we the official sandman group then or are we going to rotate people in out of oh we, we need to have ria on we need to have tony on we need to have yeah. steve on we need to try and rotate it i mean we can we can have a, a core one or two but i want to hear hear you guys as much as i want to speak to you but sandman is my jam and if i miss one i will be cut to the quick but i also want to hear everyone else's thoughts on it because i've learned something today i've seen different perspectives today and that's what makes doing this a joy absolutely love it so thank you all as for my horrible self um you can catch me on the internet just type steve j ray or fantastic universes into google and that will take you to everything i do news reviews features interviews across fantastic universes dc comics news dark knight news and cbr you can hear me on the dc comics news podcast and on i am the night where my offspring and i chat about batman the animated series doing a week by week breakdown of every single episode and you can catch me on twitter please talk to me about anything you like at l steve e l underscore s t e e v o this show comics and canon classic comics are on the comics and motion feed you can find that everywhere you find podcasts apple Podcasts, stitcher google play you name it it's there this show will also be on youtube so do if you like what we do like us rate us subscribe give us stars tell your friends tell the dog tell the endless tell the universe we want to see you hear you and talk to you why because we love you and until the next episode of the book club steve signing off mike tonya dave matthew Thank you for a beautiful couple of hours and for reading this great book, which is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs>